Good morning, everyone. I am Julio Gutierrez from the BSC, and I'm going to chair the session of this morning. So before starting with the presentation, I will just remind you some practicalities, which are the same as yesterday if you were here. So please try to keep your camera and your mic off during the presentations, unless you are the one presenting or making a question. For the questions, please use the raise your hand function in Zoom, and I will open your mic, or you can open the mic, or use the, the chat. All the sessions will be recorded and shared afterwards. And if you have any issues, any questions or comments, you can just send us an email to this address here. This is just a summary of the, the day we have for today. So in the morning, we will have a session on atomistic simulations of fusion reactor materials. And then we'll have a session on, tur on turbulences. And after lunch, we'll have a couple of sessions on magneto hydrodynamics. So let me now introduce first speaker of this morning is a, it's a keynote presentation that will be given by Professor Fiura Jirabekova. Fiura studied at the Tashkent State Technical University in Uzbekistan, and she did her PhD at the Arifov Institute of Electronics. She held several research positions in Uzbekistan, Japan, and Belgium before moving to Helsinki about 10 years ago. And she's now professor in materials of extreme environments. She's very well known in the, in the area, so I, I think she doesn't need much of an introduction, but she has published more than 200 papers, more than 4,000 citations. And the title of the talk of today will be Material Simulations from First Principles and in the, with Application in the Fusion Research and Development. So, Flora, whenever you're ready, please. Yeah. Your... Thank you. Thank you very much, Julio, for the very nice in, uh, introduction. And now I'm ready to also share my uh, slide here. And uh, yes, um, so now already uh, I was introduced. So this is why, please uh, let me uh, begin just with uh, sending my very Merry Christmas greetings to everybody because it's really time for ending the year, year for uh, and looking for the future year for new achievements in the field. And I'm really uh, happy to share our or our contributions in this very important field of uh, development of the fusion, especially now when uh, we got such a very nice uh, breakthrough in this field. And I think that we are actually getting more hopes for the future of fusion. And uh, also I would like to acknowledge the, my presentation here at this workshop because of course, the high performance computing facilities are very important for us, and these are actually making our work possible. And so let's see what I have uh, for you to present today. And I was asked to uh, just to give uh, a bit of uh, the, the maybe um, insights in development of materials with respect to the fusion uh, reaction for the fusion reactors. And I will be presenting today work, which is uh, done not by me only. So it is the contribution from Jesper Bugmaster the, the, to the large extent. And then there are two young uh, contributors here, Miko Koskeniemi and Guain Wei, and uh, Kai Nordlund and myself. So, and uh, this is all done the work at the University of Helsinki. First of all, uh, not, maybe not all of uh, you are working with materials and if you are, uh, working on the fusion plasma, of course, uh, there are very many um, challenges uh, that need to be resolved before we can actually claim that we know how to control this uh, uh, this effect. But uh, not less problems we have with uh, with materials, and if we are actually do, um, look at the the damages which we can see uh, in the materials in this condition, this would be divided in two parts. One is the, the, the damage which is uh, uh, experienced at the surface of the materials. And you see this, uh, these are indicated by red light. And this is the, the, there are those which are immediately coming from the plasma wall interactions, but this is not the only ones. And we are also have to look deeper into the, um, in, into these uh, wall materials because we are having neutrons and these neutrons would create damage 
which is uh, accumulating and giving uh, difficulties of controlling the materials in the future. And we have very high energy neutrons in this reaction. So we really do need to look quite deep in the material and see what exactly uh, is expected from this damage. And uh, first of all, we have to, of course, remember that neutrons uh, are not interacting uh, with a very high probability with uh, atoms so with, with, with atoms of the materials. So they have that relatively low uh, the cross section of interaction. So this really means that they can uh, go very deep. And if we are um, having this kind of interaction, we can easily get recoils of uh, in the material, which would be very high energy. And in tungsten, they can get uh, up to hundreds of kV. And here is an example of what we can expect uh, from this kind of a damage in the material. So you see, we have really this uh, spikes of the uh, energy deposition and these spikes will uh, uh, displace many, many atoms. And at the end, we will have a number of the defects which remain there. And this, of course, accumulating would change the property of materials. And so what can we do about it? It's uh, that we need to look into the inside. And fusion is, uh, of course, quite a well-established already field, but much of the information which comes uh, in, in very handy in the fusion materials are coming from those which are already understood uh, in the materials in the fusion reactors. And here we have uh, already uh, quite well uh, established um, understanding of what is happening to the material, that the materials do uh, harden, they, they become brittle, they swell. And here you have an example of uh, highly radiated uh, iron. And you see that the, the size is really increasing uh, by uh, almost on the centimeter scale. And here is on the left is the graph which indicates this increase of the uh, radiation uh, dose, we will have much more brittle, much harder materials. And this, of course, uh, leads to the fact that the materials are much less durable, much less capable of uh, uh, like withstanding the, the use, the further use. So again, uh, back to the idea how we do understand this uh, damage accumulation, the production, we have different length scales, we have the uh, different time scales, and we do actually have it a little bit put in, uh, in uh, increasing with uh, both sides. So first we have to understand what is happening in the primary damage in those cascades, which I just showed you a moment ago. But then we also have to have some understanding how this accumulates into the bigger uh, structures like bubbles, uh, like forming the some voids, maybe some uh, some um, interstitial loops, some dislocation loops, and these dislocations would uh, of course move in the material, and they again agglomerate and uh, create uh, much more uh, stronger fractures, and this would change macroscopic properties. All of this is uh, sort of known uh, to to already uh, to the scientists, but still the predictive models are very hard to achieve. And these are sometimes can be done concurrently, but most of the time they have to be put in the different uh, scales that we can actually take the inputs from the previous calculations and uh, look forward for a higher scale in time and in length. So there is uh, quite a good work is uh, done within this uh, European Eurofusion uh, EMF um, uh, work package. And uh, this is, uh, so our work is pretty much part of this, um, uh, of this package. So first of all, what do we need to know before we actually can go to see the, uh, what kind of a damage can be relevant to the fusion uh, materials? Uh, this is, of course, the fact that we are dealing with much higher energy of uh, neutrons. So if uh, the neutrons are uh, interacting with uh, tungsten atoms, and the tungsten is the, the material which is uh, accepted to be uh, of the main construction material for the, uh, for the ITAR. So we, we will have in fusion reactors, we will have only 10 kV uh, 
uh, recoils, but in the fusion reactors, uh, these recoils can be as high as 150 kV. And of course, these kind of energies would introduce much stronger damage. And here I also give you an example. Also tungsten is a strong material and it is pretty much resistant, but still these kind of high energies would create uh, a number of uh, these uh, structures, which are, these are the example of a single cascade, but if you start accumulating this damage from different cascades, so we will probably very quickly have um, the, the material which is uh, very different in, their proper, in its properties. The all is good, and uh, the, of course, the computational simulation is uh, capable of helping the experimentalists to understand what is happening with materials. But uh, what is uh, the main understanding, which came from the simulation part, is that uh, not the primary um, or this uh, small uh, defects, which are actually causing troubles, but th uh, the fact that these defects are uh, the um, accumulating in the much larger clusters. And this is exactly where we start getting limits and we are not uh, sure whether we are able to predict correctly because all the potentials which exist this far are predicting the, these uh, clusters. As you see here, the uh, several examples for the different uh, classical potentials in use, uh, they are uh, predicting us very diff different evolution of this um, of the structures. And if, if so, how can we trust that we are actually able to predict something which is not happening only on the smaller scales, but all of this is a contribution to the much larger scales. And in this case, of course, we have to be uh, somehow be aware of uh, whether or not we can actually uh, correlate the prediction of the potentials with the experiments which are making our life even harder. And this is the example of all these possible processes which we can expect. And as you see, they are multiple and they are sometimes happening uh, in, uh, in parallel. Sometimes they are uh, uh, happening in a concerted way. And of course, predicting all of them is uh, quite a challenge. So now I will start uh, presenting you what is our latest contribution to the field. Of course, uh, we have done quite a number of works before with the pure tungsten. But uh, then we decided that maybe we can actually use this new fashion in the field of the material science and use the machine learned methods to try to uh, somehow uh, produce maybe more reliable potential, something which we can trust more. And uh, this, uh, this started already in 2005 when I was still working in Belgium. We, had, uh, we used the, our uh, machine learned algorithms to predict the barriers for diffusional processes. And then we started to think hard how we can actually combine all this information which we already collected about the materials into something which can be used in a much better predictable uh, manner. So, and uh, also, meanwhile, the information about high entropy alloys started to come in and they started to show really much more promising uh, properties, for instance, the radiation resistance was proven to be much better. So you see here some few examples of this, uh, of, of um, that they would confirm the statement. They are coming from the paper published in uh, 2019. And we see that the hardening of materials is uh, much less uh, apparent. And uh, generally, the, um, also the dislocation loops are not visible in the experiments. And so it is believed that the high entropy alloys may be a solution to all our uh, current problems is uh, tungsten in brittlement, for instance. And moreover, we do have uh, a good uh, uh, sort of idea what kind of a behavior we can expect from the uh, from uh, tungsten or from, uh, uh, from, from the material, from metals in general. So if we can calculate a different uh, structures with DFT, so we can know what are the energies are expected from these different structures and what kind of the uh, interatomic forces uh, also can be expected if the atoms are put in a certain position. So we really can calculate many of these configurations, but, uh, and then we also, probably can use some kind of a descriptor to try to summarize it into the model and uh, use this uh, model as a training data for the machine learning algorithm and produce uh, a reliable potential for this. 
Luckily, it was not uh, our work. So it's already in 2010 and 2013, there were uh, good publications on uh, suggestion how to use these uh, machine learned approaches to develop potentials. And uh, we decided to, to go with this because it sounded the, the most promising one. It is, I'm talking about the Gaussian approximation potentials. And as you see here, so everything what we do need to have is pretty much that some, some sort of a descriptor. We use the Gaussian uh, process regressor for this, um, uh, for, uh, for this procedure. So we will, uh, we, will, we will find the kernel functions, which find the similarities between the different descriptors. And then we have the regression coefficients, and then we look over many environments. And this way we actually end up having uh, good predictions of energies and the forces as well. To simplify a little bit the whole idea behind this uh, potential, we can also tell that uh, we, we can also see that we can divide the descriptors by just uh, to, to simplify the, the whole idea of it. So we can uh, uh, separate the two dimensional, sorry, two body, three body and multi body, um, many body descriptors separately and try to see the, how this can help us to make the whole process much more efficient. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, of fact, that there are several descriptors and uh, the, the most uh, commonly used, and it, is, it was uh, proposed by Bartok and uh, colleagues uh, in 2013. Uh, this is a smooth overlap of atomic positions. Uh, so-called SOAP uh, descriptor. And this is uh, the one which is giving usually the most accurate predictions because you are really uh, describing the, all the po possible environments uh, around the atoms. And these are uh, giving us the pretty much uh, almost the same information as what we are feeding uh, from our DFT-based uh, database. But there are also uh, other possibilities to have uh, this soap can be also split, as I said, in the two and three body uh, parts. And also this, uh, uh, the many body part can be replaced by, for instance, EM densities. So all of this is possible. And uh, this is how, uh, how the, the, the potential uh, functional form looks like. And I only forgot to mention here that we also can add uh, the external uh, potential to this uh, to this functional form uh, to be able to describe our processes which are happening under the uh, radiation uh, ion radiation condition or the uh, the collision cascades. So because we do need these uh, very short range interactions, and this is uh, well known that the DFT data cannot uh, reproduce this part uh, very accurately. So we do need uh, different. Uh, sort of this universal repulsive uh, potential type uh, calculations uh, where we can actually add this part into the, the more uh, equilibrium, uh, the, the, sorry, the part of the potential which describes the e equilibrium type of the interactions. Okay, so speaking about the, this is all about the potential. And now let me just uh, show you some, a few examples what we can do with this. So first of all, we do need to reproduce the collision cascades, as I said. So we do need uh, very strong interactions and also how these uh, uh, atoms which are placed into the defective sites would relax uh, during the annealing processes. So you see here is an example of uh, another example of the cascade in the in iron, and if we do so many many of these cascades, overlapping cascades, uh, then we see that actually the whole uh, the the whole uh, defective structure is growing quite strongly. And if at the beginning we barely see any kind of a dislocation structures, so after many cascades overlapping. We already can distinguish the dislocation loops here. Some of them are mobile and some of them are sessile. And uh, this also uh, adds to the, uh, the accumulation of the, uh, of the damage in future. And um, so we also have uh, the need to describe the very the strong repulsive uh, uh, interactions, as I said. And also we have very high uh, temperatures inside of our cascades. So all of these must be uh, introduced into the potential. 
So uh, what, what needs to be done to develop a good potential? First of all, one needs to create a very accurate uh, data set. And these data uh, can be uh, quite extensive, but one should be careful because uh, if you are overworking it and producing too much data, this might be a, a also overfitting your potential. And this is also not, not very good. So we usually use about, about 2000 uh, different uh, configurations to fit our potential. So it is plus minus depending on the, on the, on the structures. And you see that here we have different, uh, really different configurations with different uh, volumes, with different strains, the compressive, uh, the, uh, the tensile stresses, we have liquids, we have um, amorphous structures, we have crystal structures, we have defects uh, included, and also uh, very important to have the surface uh, energies to be included in this uh, database. And we have also, uh, have developed uh, several potentials already by now. So these are the pure element potentials. So you can find the references in these uh, publications if you are interested in or contact uh, us uh, if, you, if you need any kind of uh, additional explanation to these. But I would like to highlight here the actual uh, achievements which we got from uh, these uh, potentials. And you see for instance, the melting curves here, we are actually under the pressure. We can uh, capture it quite well. So it is uh, better compared to the DFT data and to the experiment, uh, what, what we uh, obtain with the gap potentials for, uh, for both for molybdenum and tantalum. But uh, one uh, finds very interesting to see that we are actually capable of reproducing the displacement energies. So this is this is beautiful flower here. It just shows a different um, direct direction. So where the displacement uh, energies were tested, and we see that we are very correctly capturing the minimum of the displacement energy along the 100 direction, and it is uh, about 45 eV, which is uh, quite close to the experimental value. So uh, I would also say a few words about this, uh, uh, the high entropy alloys. And here we do need to, to be more careful because actually the so potentials are uh, quite heavy for these calculations. Uh, here is uh, the, just some kind of a test uh, for the configurations, for different configurations. And these tests show us that we do really need to go to the low, uh, low dimensional uh, descriptors. And in this case, if we separate them, that we are having much better predict, uh, much easier and much better prediction than going with a pure soap because soap requires for this kind of a in numerous uh, amount of different configurations. You would need a lot of data, and this is pretty much impossible. So this is why going with uh, quite a low dimensional uh, gap, uh, with uh, having two two body, three body, and EM. For instance, a description for the uh, many body interactions, we are getting uh, very accurate results. So um, also uh, the, the part which is, uh, which is uh, describing the multi-body potential, uh, potential is also not, not always necessary to really go with the accurate soap uh, descriptors, which is possible, but uh, again, slows down the performance. So this is why sometimes for some cases we are using, especially for the high entropy alloys, we are using just uh, the simple AEM function as it is used in the classical potentials. So uh, one thing to say that uh, without giving too many details uh, on, on the equations here, I just would like to say that this was a really uh, an interesting uh, finding by Jesper that there was a suggestion to use actually tab tabulation of the predictions of gap. And instead of uh, really uh, predicting uh, using the directly the gap potential during the calculations, which is pretty slow and not efficient. So you can pre-tabulate the predictions for a few configurations and then just use the, the cubic spline uh, interpol, uh, interpolation and just uh, find uh, the, the values which would be uh, most likely uh, used uh, or uh, corresponding to this configuration. So this gave us a very strong speed up. So this, uh, this graph shows that actually if you, this is all these uh, open, uh, open symbols are showing the different uh, values for the gap trained for the different uh, sets of the 
of, of the configurations. And you see that we have uh, quite, um, if, if we have a good performance and a good energy convergence, then we have a very high uh, computational cost. But uh, then the computational costs are, if you want to decrease them, then we are uh, very easily getting to the very high uh, energy uh, the, the errors. And this, this is the result of the, this uh, tab gap, the tabulated gap poten potential. So you see that the efficiency is much higher while we are practically not losing on the accuracy of it. And these are the details which we, um, uh, we, we, which uh, we show the comparison of the data for the equi-atomic uh, uh, alloys uh, here on this higher up uh, graph. So here you see the points which are coming from directly from the DFT calculations, and the lines are the predictions of the, uh, the, the tap gap potential. So they are really exceptionally good, and these are also the bulk modulus uh, from the tap gap and from the DFT, which is derived from these curves. And you see that practically all points are lying on this line. And we are also having here the data compare, compared of the, of the um, configurations, which are, which are not equiatomic, but just random configurations. And we see that uh, the, the prediction is, at least on this graph, looks very good. And if you look uh, also on this data for the bulk moduli, which are derived from this graph, we have a slightly worse uh, performance compared to the equiatomic uh, compositions, but yet it is very good. It's really very, very uh, nice to have this uh, very accurate description of uh, these properties. And uh, if you look now for the formation of the uh, defects, so we see something really amazing because if uh, we compare the behavior of the defects in the high entropy alloys to to the pure tungsten, for instance. So we see that actually the interstitials, the self-interstitial atoms in this case are not really uh, moving along a single line, but they are more uh, like three-dimensional. They have the three-dimensional motion. And this is really impressive because this makes the high entropy alloys uh, quite different. And we do also expect a different behavior with accumulation of the dose. But um, also here we see, see that the formation energy for the different interstitial depends on the environment. So this is why we have this violin shape of, uh, of this data. And uh, so the one of these exciting uh, results, uh, I must say that uh, one has to be careful taking this, uh, these results with, uh, uh, with a pinch of salt here because uh, we see this, these results were not uh, obtained from the uh, from the cascade simulations, but just uh, through the Monte Carlo swapping algorithm. And uh, we see that as a matter of fact, that there is a, a bit of a segregation of some elements and there is also ordering in, the, in this high entropy alloys, which is not really a desirable feature of, uh, of these materials, but one also has to pay attention that, uh, for instance, if you look at the mixing enthalpies of this of uh, these materials so we see that the, there are some of the of the elements are really want to mix together but still the energies are relatively low so this is why uh, uh, most likely the this segregation and ordering would be taking quite long time before this uh, starts appearing and we also see the segregation of the uh, voids and the uh, on, on the voids, we see the segregation of the larger elements and we see the segregation. So the ni niobium would segregate on the surface of the voids. And uh, we see the segregation of vanadium on the interstitial loops. So these graphs are showing the, how the concentration of vanadium is decreasing, uh, uh, going away from the center. And uh, also we see the segregation of uh, these elements on the grain boundaries, if you do not, if you do not have vanadium included, so the next next uh, small uh, atom is niobium. So we see lots of niobium here. But if vanadium is also included, then the vanadium is preferentially segregating on the uh, on the surfaces of on the interfaces and between the grain uh, between the grains. And here is the just the uh, simulation of the annealing of these uh, defects in tungsten and uh, high entropy alloy. And what we see here that uh, in tungsten, all the defects are accumulating in, 
uh, forming the dislocation loops, which are also fairly mobile. While in the high entropy alloys, the uh, loops are forming, but they are tiny. And this is uh, making the difference between the two materials and also explains why the loops are not seen in uh, experiments and because they are very small. And we have also the explanation to this uh, behavior uh, saying that, um, uh, that the, the uh, defects uh, are in, uh, in high entropy alloys have the comparable mobility between the interstitials and the vacancies. So this is why they are actually competing uh, while they are accumulating. And also the dislocations have a very low mobility in the high entropy alloys. And uh, also the last uh, message, I'm almost running out of uh, my time, but I really thought that this is uh, quite a cute uh, new results we got uh, very recently. We compared two materials. Uh, it's, it's just a binary alloys, but one is uh, tungsten and molybdenum, where we have a very similar lattice parameter, while we have different uh, atomic uh, masses. And then there is uh, uh, tungsten tantalum, which, is, which has an opposite uh, ratio. So similar masses, but uh, very different uh, lattice parameters. And we compare these results to the available AM potential, which I must say that we have to be careful about it. As I said uh, at the beginning, the AM potentials are also not always uh, capturing the whole process, uh, but still this was the one which was available. And when we compare this, uh, the results from our uh, tab gap and uh, this AM potential, so what we see that pretty much for tungsten and molybdenum system, the AM potential is uh, giving much higher uh, production of the defects. This is the Frankel pairs. And, uh, but still the more or less the trend uh, with increase of the tungsten content is uh, captured by AM potential. While the, uh, actually the tantalum system is uh, behaving quite differently. And this is a little bit odd because you see the pure tantalum gives a certain amount of the, of the Frankel pairs, but then adding a little bit of a tungsten immediately increasing of the number of the of the Frankel pairs. So we were a little bit uh, surprised because it's actually um, expected to be uh, more like what we see in our AM potential. So this is why we looked at uh, the threshold energies and this is what displacement energies. And what we found here that while actually the AM potential gives a little bit too low, threshold energies, which is again, is a feature, but still quite similar to what we see in our tab gap potential. And uh, the, for the tungsten tantalum system, it is very, very odd. We have a very strong, uh, the threshold uh, displacement, uh, high, high display threshold uh, displacement for 50% uh, of the content of tungsten. And then we looked at the interatomic potentials and uh, what, what is happening, especially on the repulsive part. And we found that you see here this blue line, which is describing the repulsive uh, interactions between tungsten and tantalum is a way over, uh, a way too steep. And this of course makes the system to be much more resistant to the, to the displacements because the atoms are pushing and do not really allow the, the displacement to take place. So this was a nice observation. And I think that the, my message here would be just please do be careful and uh, look uh, uh, in particular in all these uh, uh, small uh, features which the authors of the potential may not pay attention to, but they might be critical when you are looking for specific uh, properties of materials, especially with respect to radiation effects. Here are my conclusions and uh, just wanted to remind you, this is uh, something uh, to probably make it clear that we have uh, quite good potentials nowadays uh, for uh, pure uh, uh, BCC materials. And uh, we also developed a reliable and uh, sufficiently efficient tap gap potential for uh, high entropy alloys. So now we are also looking for the similar potential for the FCC materials, which is a little bit more tricky than BCC, but yet I hope that soon we will be able to publish this too. And so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm looking for questions from you. Okay, so thank you, Julia, for this nice presentation, very interesting work. So before, questions come out, I will, I have a couple. So first of all, one of the main issues when you do a, a gap potential, 
is the scalability with the number of elements, right? So the normal scales quadratically with the number of elements. I think there is a version as that scales linearly now, but how does this tab gap scales with the number of elements? Uh, if I remember correctly, that uh, uh, the uh, we um, we managed to to have it the linear scaling with the number of elements. It is exactly because of this uh, uh, two two body three body plus am part, which is uh, which is not really making it uh, the quadratic anymore. So it's uh, this is this also increases the efficiency. Oh, okay, and then following this one, like how where do you think is the limit? Like, okay, now you have these five elements, equiatomic or near equiatomic, that has been motivated from experimental work. How yeah. many different elements do you think you can put, or if you can do like big list of elements and do kind of high throughput calculations from DFT and from these MD potentials, or where do you think and how far do you think can you go? I think that this uh, this is really very very interesting question. The the fact is that uh, uh, the it does seem that uh, uh, like a very large number of elements is not really uh, improving any any longer the properties what we are looking for because the what our uh, observation is that if the pure element has a certain um, like differences, for instance, as I was presenting this uh, last uh, example of uh, tungsten tantalum versus tungsten molybdenum. So you see that this, uh, that the fact that the tantalum has a much larger lattice parameter is affecting on how the material reacts uh, in, in this uh, radiation condition. And these kind of things are uh, definitely one has to pay attention to. And uh, also when you start uh, having a very uh, large differences in the masses, the segregation uh, uh, probability is increasing because uh, then the atoms are really uh, start looking for uh, the places where they have either uh, less uh, volume available or more volume available. And this also would uh, probably work against the idea of using high entropy alloys because the segregation leads to, the, to just uh, forming those inclusions of pure elements which are uh, worsening the quality of the, of the high entropy alloys. And uh, so I think that uh, this far, uh, five elements seems to be very reasonable. We did not try six elements, uh, which is uh, probably with this approach, with a tab gap, we definitely would go with tab gap. For the one element, we still prefer the gap, pure gap, because tab gap is still, as, as I said, that there is a bit too much of approximations there. But uh, of course, the more elements we add, the less accurate information becomes because it depends on the training set. So how much uh, of a configuration you can cover. And of course, at some point we will start having uh, really, uh, uh, what is this, um, underfeated <laughs> data, and then it's uh, not reliable anymore. So I think that uh, five, we are confident. With more, I would not really give my word yet. <laughs> so we have to try first. Okay, thank you. So I see that Charlotte Becker has her hand up. For a while, so Charlotte, please feel free to unmute. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Fiora, for a very interesting talk. And, and actually, to, to continue on what Julio asked, um, how confident are you uh, for in your potentials for dilute alloys? You know, tungsten with a little bit of molybden or tungsten with a little bit of tantalum. And, 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 and that, you know, something linked to this question is how many uh what part of your training set was on dilute alloys and dilute alloys of course including defects yes uh, this is a very good question i think that the the less um uh, the less concentrations we have the more we would uh, rather go to the just the pure soap uh, the the sorry the pure gap potentials uh because uh, they they are also can be uh, split into the uh, two body, three body, and EM part, but uh, still, uh, it would be probably uh, more accurate to instead of the using tab gap to use directly this um, the the machine learned uh, potential, the gap potential directly. Why why it is so? It is uh, because in this case we are having much more data which would be uh, um, which would be included in the training set. If we have dilute alloys, we do have them in, in our training data now, but of course they are limited. 
And uh, at the moment uh, we used uh, for the same, uh, the potential which I presented now uh, was used for the uh, tungsten uh, molybdenum and tungsten tantalum uh, alloys, but they were also high concentration. So, and this is uh, why we are actually quite confident in the results and they, because they were covering uh, many of the possible compositions. But if we are really focusing on only on the dilute alloys, so I think that it would be probably necessary to get more data in that uh, range of the concentrations. And in this case, uh, the, the, our experience is so that the tab gap is much less accurate. But at the same time, uh, we would, the, it is always the compromise between the computational costs and the accuracy. If the accuracy tolerates, so you really can still use tab gap. And for all the radiation simulation this far, we are using tab gap. It is uh, because gap uh, potential is very slow. Okay, uh, yeah. thank you very I just, much. I, I think that you do really need uh, just in your training data, just focus more on the yeah. on the, the configurations of your interest. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, and we have a couple of questions now in the in the chat. So one is from Mary Kay Chessy, who is asking, how do you know when you have sufficient or too many configurations in your, in your training data? So, but this is uh, this is exactly what uh, I, I. Sorry, I did not really uh, have time to go in details. But we are uh, looking at this uh, kind of the convergent uh, tests on depending on the number of the configurations. So the the troubles uh, is that uh, not all configurations might be uh, might be converged in DFT. So, and this is uh, another type of a problem we are dealing with. Uh, with it now in. Uh, for the FCC materials there because of the magnetic properties. Uh, this gives us hard time. So luckily in the VCC, it was much smoother, but you are just simply adding uh, more configurations and uh, see whether we are uh, converging at the, the energy test errors. And uh, as you see here, we also separately look at the crystals and liquids because liquids have uh, much less organized stru structures and they are much, uh, they, they have different densities. And so just to specifically um, make sure that we capture both faces uh, accurately enough. So we just uh, test them separately. Okay, thank you. And then we have another question here from Gautam Anand asking, did your interatomic potential reproduce the chemical shear range order in the high entropy alloy? Uh, this is another uh, uh, in, another thing which I uh, showed here. <laughs> so, and this is, uh, this is where we look at this uh, short range ordering and we see that uh, some elements do actually segregate. So this is, you see that the, the, this uh, short, this, this is a chemical uh, short, uh, short range order. And uh, some of these uh, elements are like, like to be separated. And again, it depends very much on the, uh, first of all, the mixing enthalpies uh, that uh, this, you see that some of the elements are, do not uh, really like to mix together, but some are start ordering. But usually we have this binary ordering uh, most of the time, not like uh, really all five elements are ordered in a very specific order. Okay, and then we have a question from Mervy Mansinen. So could you be able to comment on the approach, if any, of fusion materials modeling community in the preparation of IFMIC Dones? Sorry, for, for, for which? She, she's asking on how this materials modeling community is engaged or is related with the preparation of the IFMIC Dones experiment. Uh, I'm sorry, I probably would not be able to comment uh, on the community prepara preparation, but I think that we are actually uh, pretty ready to, uh, to, to face the, the many uh, problems of the fusion materials. So we start now having, uh, um, the, the, there are many uh, different works which are going on in our uh, group, and I just presented uh, these potentials because of limited time, but otherwise uh, I think that we are already having quite good uh, understanding of how the damage, how we can reproduce really high dose uh, damage in these materials. And now when we have accurate potentials, so probably we will be able to make it uh, even, even better. So I, I would say that uh, we are pretty ready. <laughs> 
So, but uh, that's, uh, I, I'm sorry, I cannot co uh, comment on the whole community. Okay, I think I have time for one very last question. So it's also about the training sets. So when you make training set for a single element, you have a number of initial configurations. Yeah. When you have like for more elements, do you have to double or basically it will increase quadratically with the number of elements, the size of the training set, right? So I imagine that if you now have access to a exascale or pxscale computing resource to Lumi, for example, then you should be able to automatize all this training or how far are you from that? Do you think this is possible? This is yeah, this is this is extremely good question. Actually, the our uh, the project, what uh, Jesper, for instance, uh, working at the moment, is exactly looking at the possible ways how we can automatize it by using even the human uh, experience. So this is this is something. Uh, unfortunately, for for a machine, it's very difficult to. Uh, really uh, capture patterns. So when we are speaking about training data about this uh, multi-element uh, alloys, uh, we have to also uh, be clear about this. So we are not really uh, going, uh, we are sampling our space of uh, different parameters. And this uh, pretty much, uh, uh, we, we are not really going with um, uh, the quadratic functions because we are not going through all possible configurations. We still sample it. This is why the tab gaps are very convenient to us because we have a limited uh, configurations uh, which are uh, in the training in the, in the training data. We do not really go for a very 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 extensive side. More uh, moreover, the more uh, the the larger the training data, the slower potentials uh, become for the use. So there is always this um, uh, the uh, what you have to do the compromise uh, what you are after. So are you really want to do a very accurate uh, pre uh, predictions or you want to make it uh, efficient calculation and get some idea of what is happening? So the idea of this um, uh, of this current work is to really uh, find a way. Uh, to to find those very critical configurations which would be the most uh, decisive for the properties of the materials and this is really something which is uh, I would not say that it is an easy task we are looking for different possibilities but uh, this far um, our main uh, concern is to try to to capture as many surfaces as possible and uh, the liquid phases are uh, pretty much uh, random. So we, we are not really uh, able uh, to capture all of these. But uh, the um, crystal, with the crystal configurations, is, the situation is a bit easier, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but the liquids and uh, the surfaces is, uh, of course, uh, they, they are very much de depending on the chemistry. And uh, this, is, uh, this is still challenging. Okay, so thanks, Fura, for the nice talk and the interesting q and I think it's now time to move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much, and I, I wish you all the, the good uh, uh, good workshops. Bye-bye. So the next talk will be given by Javier Dominguez Gutierrez from Nomaten Center of Excellence, National Center for Nuclear Research in Poland. And the talk will be on the computational study of nano indentation in crystalline molybdenum. So, Javier, when you are ready. You're mute. What about now? Yeah. Hi, Julio. Nice to meet and nice to see you again. <laughs> Um, everybody can can see me, my screen. It's it's okay. Yeah, it's alright. We don't see the full screen now. What about now? It's loading. Yeah, now now it's alright. Okay. So um, good morning, everybody. I'm going to be a little bit brief. Um, Today I'm going to talk, as Julio said, uh, about the computational study on nano indentation inducing molybdenum by atomistic dislocation models. As Professor Flura Jura Vekova said, we now have uh, very wonderful uh, potentials based on machine learning to model the interaction between the damage of the materials 
due to the interaction of this plasma facing components with the plasma in some fusion machine. So I'm really interested in the mechanical properties and to see what is happening with the radiation effects or high temperature effects in this kind of, of materials. And so for this reason, this is the motivation that, that I have. And when we are talking about wonder, wonderful materials with excellent mechanical properties, and what the people say that these materials can be the promising materials for building a fusion machine, how can we know this? We need to test it. And the most easy thing to test is the material, uh, the hardness and the elastic modulus and all these the properties that we need for a better material for a fusion machine or other extreme operating conditions, uh, we need to do nano indentation. Uh, nano indentation is a easy technique. Well, <laughs> well, um, easy in the idea in the in the real life is not that easy. So the idea is only you take an indenter tip, which is always a diamond, and you only test in the surface of the material, and you record the force as a function of the indentation depth in an, this so-called LD curve. And we follow the Oliver Farr method to compute the hardness, the stiffness, the elastic modulus, and all these mechanical properties. But in the in the comparison with the modeling, how we can do a qualitative description of the dislocation nucleation during this elastic to plastic transition transition due to nano indentation induced plasticity mechanism in the materials. So the idea is that in the experiments you have some protocols that is called load control mode. But in, in the numerical simulation, we have another protocol which is called displacement control um, control method. So here I'm showing some uh, agreement for pure iron. We are here we are using more than 20 million atoms to show that we have this comparison that in the empty simulations, we can have this popping, which is fitted to the Hertz uh, curve. You can see the green line there, and then you have the deviation of the force respect to the Hertz fitting. That is called the popping event, which determines the transition between the elastic part uh, to the plastic region. And then in the experiment, you also can fit it to the Hertz fitting because we have an spherical indenter tip and you can see the popping length and the popping in the critical lot define the popping event, and then you see the plastic region. So this is the way we can compare experiments and nano indentation. But in order to understand not only the, the properties or the macroscopic uh, feature of these materials, we also need to understand what is inside, what is happening inside of the material this kind of dislocations are being nucleated because you are indenting and you are doing it, creating and practically damaging the, the material. So some dislocations inside are being nucleated and then propagated and there is some interaction with them, there is some annihilation and something is happening here. So because of dislocation theory, we can compare the result from the MD simulations and um, molecular dynamic simulations to the real life by using, um, we can say, um, scanning electron microscopy images, uh, transmission electron microscopy images that is not that easy. One needs to cut the lamella, need to see the thickness of this material, take it to the lab, uh, put it in the microscope. Also, we have some other issues to, to see these dislocations in the real life, the, const, the contrast in the materials, also the angle that you are cutting the lamella when you are indented the material. So, this comparison needs to be aid by MD simulations. It's not only that you go to the experiment and you cut uh, the, in the, the sample when this is indented and then you say, ah, this is my dislocation network and this is happening with my material. Okay, and then what? The dislocation got in this plane, is it glides in that plane or what is happening with the material? So that's the reason the experimental people need the guidance of the, of the modeling. But what is happening then? Then we have the pristine case and then we take the material to some irradiation and then some, some dislocation loops are being uh, created due to the irradiation inside of the material. And then they also interact because when you are bombarding with this ion, then you have your irradiated material. And then it depends on the, uh, the kinetic energy that you have from your ions. It can be one mega electron volts that we can see here from, from the M4F project. And we have then five mega electron volts and everything is different. You have also need to cut it and to see the CEM images and everything can be different. You have the, the, the 
these location loops for a BCC iron, for example, here, then if they are really close to the surface, and then you have more dislocation loops that you, when you increase the energy, the radiation energy, now the loops go uh, more inside. And then now it's difficult to see how to do the nanoindentation because if you indent only to the first layers of the sample, yeah, if you have an energy of one mega electron volt, you are going to see this interaction with the loops. But then if you have higher radiation, you need to check where is the maximum um, damage in the material and you need to go deeper with the non-indenter. So now the experimental people need more help to, to try to understand what is happening with nanoindentation in irradiated samples. So for example, in molybdenum, we took the EAM potentials with correction CDL and uh, Finis and Claire that we, they were developed in the group of Professor Fruyera Kova and Kai Norlum. So this, these potentials were um, developed for collision cascades, but we tried to understand if these potentials can be also used for mechanical uh, testing. And it turned out that yes, for molybdenum, we reproduce the, the, well, we have a good agreement with the results that Professor Jorge Alcala may, reported for BCC tantalum, but we are reporting for BCC molybdenum. We have the same order for the popping event at different, uh, and the effects of the crystal orientation in this transition from elastic to plastic deformation. However, as I mentioned, we need to see what is what is happening with the dislocation nucleation and the effect of the temperature and irradiation in the material. And this is the important thing because here molybdenum is telling us, look, when you nucleate the dislocations at a low, uh, um, low temperature, you can have this distribution, you nucleate in this, in this way, also the crystal orientation is different, your stress underneath the indenter tip will be the maximum, but the, I'm also following the slip planes and I'm guiding the, the, the dislocations, how to propagate, how to evolve, and, and, and the temperature is different. So we test these potentials and all the tools with the experimental data that was reported uh, by Plomer et al. And we noticed that molybdenum is doing something uh, funny respect to tungsten, that you have this stability of, har of hardness when you at uh, high temperature, you have this plateau between 400 Kelvin and 800, and then the hardness decreases. Rather than for tungsten, you have this monotic retracement as a function of the temperature. So what is the reason of that? Because of the empty simulations, we noticed that the reason of, uh, of this effect is that molybdenum has the right properties to guide the dislocations uh, to these dislocations with a forces vector 111, which is the most common one in BCC materials, to obtain these junctions. And the junctions cannot move. So this is the reason we, we have this uh, stability of the hardness. Now we understand what is happening when you increase the temperature and when you have a pristine sample. But we, now we need to, to, to see what is happening when, when you have collision cascades or you will have some radiation. And as Professor Yurabekova mentioned, you can have some DPA in the sample if you do, uh, overlap collision cascades. So let's see what's happening if you only have one single collision cascade and the lattice is distorted uh, for, for the molybdenum sample. These are the, the results that now we can use the tap gap potentials with, that they are providing excellent mechanical properties. We have a good agreement with the EAM potentials. Everything seems to, to, to work. And now we can go to 16 million atoms that that is the wonder of these tap gap potentials that it takes a little bit more of time than the original gap in order to have a social simulation uh, here in the computer center of uh, NCBJ and University of Warsaw, we can uh, run this kind of simulations with GAP. It will take like three years, but with TAP GAP, these kind of simulations take one week, two weeks. It's, it's wonderful. And for mechanical properties, as everybody says, there's parametrization. We don't need too many specific uh, samples of training data set. We only need um, certain systems to see the nucleation of the dislocations and to propagation of the of the loops. And so here I'm showing the, the, the confirmation that the tap gap potentials are working for nano indentation because we have a good agreement with the um, constitutive model and the continuum modeling that uh, guides the elastic transition to the plastic transition. However, when we perform only one collision cascade, 
at the surface, everything changes. So now the, the, the hardness of the material even changes only by only one collision cascade. This transition between the elastic to plastic changes, even the, the, the propagation of the dislocations. This, and here we can see other figure that I would like to, to show you the, the simulations that we are doing here. For example, you have the pristine indentation. This is, I'm only showing the dislocations. This is the, the simulation with 16 and 60 million atoms, but here we are only seeing the surface and the other materials. So if you have defects not close to the surface, you can see how it's nucleated in the 0, 0 in the 1, 1, 1 orientation. And you can see here how these atoms are being displaced by the indenter tip and they are following the slip planes. So here you can see this large scale simulation, how you have these half loops and probably you are going to have this twin nucleation. Then again is following the, the slip planes and being nucleated is doing something because of the indenter tip. You have this short loop, and then we have the char characteristic lasso process. When, when you have these atoms being uh, dislocated here, they, they, can, they are going to create and nucleate a prismatic dislocation loop. And this is the effect that we are looking for, the, the simulation for the dislocation loop. Then the loop is, is propagated. We remove the indenter tip, and then we have this reversible a process that is only observed uh, nearby the indenter tip. And then we see that the mobility of the, of the loop is quite slow because of, of the temperature that is 300 Kelvin. But what is happening when we have only one collision cascade and these uh, defects close to the surface? Now we have these defects. And what is happening? Because this is a collision cascade at uh, 10 kilo electron volts close to the surface. And now we can see that we are indenting, we have this propagation. Now everything changes. These uh, atoms are being added to, to the other atoms of the nucleation. Now we see that this, this defect here, this shared loop here, half loop goes in other direction, is being guided different. And now you have this, this, this uh, loop here nucleated. And then the lasso process is trying to find it's its way to nucleate the loop. Again, the loop is nucleated and we remove the indenter tip. And now it changes. Here we can see that we can uh, nucleate the loop, but if we compare this to the effect on the surface, which is important in an indentation, this can be compared with SEM images in the experiment. We notice for that pristine case, the crystallography effect is observable. And we have here these patterns, these rosettes, these four folded rosettes that are typical for BCC materials when you are doing the nano indentation. And we notice, I call it irradiated, but it has to be distorted. I apologize for this. And we notice the effect on the surface. So the effect of this collision cascade, the small defects, lattice defects in the in next to the surface don't uh, influence too much the nucleation of the dislocations. But when you have the unloading process and when everything has to be this reversible problem is not that reversible. Everything has a connection between this, the localized strain on the surface and when you come back with the dislocations. This is an important, um, uh, an important conclusion that in the experiments, this, there has to be a correction for the hardness as a function of the indenter depth because of the, these pile ups that are here, here, and that they are the accumulated strain, uh, 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 localized strains. So th there has to be some corrections that is really guided by these simulations, larger scale simulations with top gap. And these are my conclusions. And thank you so much. So thanks, Javier, for the nice talk and for keeping on time. <laughs> so I yeah, I will make a question before we see others in the chat. So. You show the evolution of the mechanical properties as a function of the temperature. But did you look at the distribution of defects as a function of temperature? Because they are probably related to each other, right? Ah, uh, yeah. 
it, yes, I did, but I'm not showing here. So I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. <laughs> the defects and the interstitials and those. Yes, it's different because when when I'm I, you can see it here in, in the stress, you have the nucleation of the defects, and then you have more and more defects. But the only the hardness. This is the microscopic uh, measurement from the Oliver Farr. So here we, you can show that here inside you right the defects uh, move different. But when you compute the hardness, since everything you have from the uh, unloading process, here it's only calculated in the surface. It's only the calculation here really, really localized. And your defects maybe are here inside. Hmm. Yeah, but yeah, yeah that's the that's other thing that I need to check. <laughs> yeah, and um, anyway, I'm not an expert in the experimental part, but I understand that you normally make nano indentation when yes. you have I don't know, a very small sample, for example, that you cannot make a strain test, for example, no? Yeah. But have you tried to make compression tests or the experimentals or you from your side try to make compression? <laughs> I understand yeah, that you make compression, you also really have. It's difficult to set up. Non-indentation is really easy. You yeah. only, compare to compression, because compression needs more stability and the sample needs to be set up here. Um, and Julio, you are always asking something difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's really difficult to set up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how difficult it is from the experimental side, but the I understand <laughs> from the simulation would be like pretty similar, right? Because you are applying pressure on one yes, single point, yes. and from the simulation you will be applying pressure from from two sides. But yes, exactly. This, you are completely right. That's the reason we are computing this strain stress as a graph. That can be have a correlation between nano indentation and compression simulation. So yes, you're right. We can we can compare and that could be a really really the next step to convert the stress strain curve from nano indentation to compression simulation. Exactly. Yep. Oh, okay. And now that I'm looking at this graph, I have one that could be again a difficult one. So I see these up and downs in the graph, which I believe this is probably not noise. But it's because atoms are moving somehow in avalanches, right? Exactly. Yeah. Have you look at that, or do you know anything about? Uh, no, here? this is the thing that everybody look at here. Yeah, you have a really good eye. Yeah, everybody. This these results are new. So, um, I'm showing really new results, and then everybody noticed that they are avalanches. But we need to 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 analyze this. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be very interesting to look at this because I mean it, it looks like a lot of up and down and yes, for sure it's not. Yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> noise, yeah. So yeah, I don't see any questions. So well, let me. I think I have time for, for a last one. <laughs> um, one question would be like, would you just as a crossover between the previous talk and this one, mm -hmm. are you considering or would you consider to make this test in a high entropy? Hello. Yes, yes, that, that would be actually the, the collaboration with the group of Professor Plura, but it takes time <laughs> because we also want to do the experiments, but yeah, it takes really, really a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's on the way. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Nice talk. I think we can move to the next one that will be given by... Jorge Suárez from the Technical University of Madrid. And the title of the talk is DFT Simulations of Light Impurities in a Defective Tungsten Grain Boundary. So, Jorge, how are you? Hi, Julio. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So whenever you're ready, stage is, the stage is yours. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Julio, for your nice introduction. I'm going to talk about the influence of tungsten green boundaries on the helium behavior by means of combined. Uh, well, I don't know why. Uh, on the helium behavior by means of combined MD and DFT approach. Okay, so one of the main problems when building a nuclear fusion reactor is related to the development of new advanced materials capable of withstand the extreme condition that exist inside a nuclear fusion reactor. These type of materials are known as plasma facing materials. Depending on the type of reactor, these plasma facing materials will be exposed to the plasma in the case of fusion, magnet fusion by magnetic confinement. As we can see here in the picture on the left, 
the plasma facing materials will be this yellow area that surrounds the plasma. While in the inertial confinement in blue, these materials will be exposed basically to the remands of the full consumed tune. Uh, my work will be mainly focused you know, on this last type of reactor. It's important to highlight this since depending on the type of reactor, the threats that these materials uh, that these materials that uh, have to withstand will be completely different. In this diagram here, I show both the energies of the infinite ions as well as the type of radiation, either pulse or continuous. As you can see, they, they change completely depending on if the magnetic or inertial case is considered. One of the most important cases here is that the ions in the magnetic confinement have an energy of a few electron volts. In this, ener this energy is below the displacement damage threshold. That means that this energy is below the energy necessary to move the atoms of the lattice. However, in this inertial case, the energy of the incoming ions is above this threshold. Also, as you can see below, uh, I say that neutrons are not really a threat in the inertial confinement. Why? Well, I will explain it using the following image. This image corresponds to a first wall of an inertial fusion reactor. Although the neutrons correspond to about the 71% of the incident radiation, they don't really see the material. This is because they, don't, they have so much energy and don't have char charge. So they go through the material without hardly seeing it. Also, there will be X-rays, which will be about only uh, one, two percent of the total, and then there will be the ions, which are the main responsible of the me me material degradation. These ions, the deuterium, tritium, and nelium, for the from the fusion reaction, are mostly the de deposit in the first five micrometers of the material. <coughs> um, this arrival of light ions produce both high thermal loads and atomistic damage. Depending on the type of reactor we are in, the damage will be close to the surface, which is the case of magnetic confinement, or deeper inside the sample, as you could observe in the previous slide for the inertial case. In general, the main effects produced by radiation in the magnetic confinement are blistering and fuss formation, while in the inertial are cracking and exfoliation. Sorry. Uh, therefore, the main requirements of the plasma facing materials must be the following, such as high thermal conductivity, high melting point, and so on. It's also important that it has a, a low retention of tritiums for safety reason, reasons, because it's a radioactive material. Uh, here, I see the, we see the main candidates to be plasma facing materials. Among them, very little one was of them, although due to its low melting point, it was discarded. Also carbon fiber composites, but the problem was they degradate very quickly and retain a lot of tritium. So finally, the most promising material was tungsten, pulp tungsten. This is due to the fact uh, that tungsten presents a series of, of great qualities such as low spatinum yields, high thermal conductivity, and high melting point. However, this material is not perfect and still has major drawbacks that do not allow it to be a guaranteed quality material in a fusion reactor. One of the main drawbacks is its ability to retain and accumulate light species, such as the helium and hydrogen, which gradually deteriorate the material. <clears throat> One st uh, one's strategy to enhance radiation resistance consists in developing nanostructured tungsten. The large density of green boundaries favors the annihilation of interstitial and vacancies, promoting self-healing which is the spontaneous return uh, to the unirradiated structure, thereby improving resistance to radi radiation effects. However, self-healing of nanostructured materials take place only under certain conditions, which are mainly related to the material's property, like grain size, grain boundary configuration, and so on. Also, it's very important the temperature of the system, as you can observe in the picture on the slide. In all ranges of temperature, the interstitial atoms are very mobile, so they quickly reach the interface, where they, rem uh, where they remain pinned. Since the formation energy is lower he here, due to they have more space. However, at low temperatures, the vacancies are immobile and don't reach the interface. In fact, in this temperature range, the number of defects is greater in the nanostructured material than in the bulk, 
since the grain boundaries are capable, capable of retaining more defects. At intermediate temperatures, when the, there is an excess in the number of interstitial and the interface, they can be emitted and recombined with separate vacancies, various atomic planes of the interface via thermally activated events at the temperatures below of those the, the vacancy movements. And finally, at high temperatures, the vacancies are mobile and are able to reach the interface where they recombine with the interstitial, thus producing a self-healing. However, this interstitial vacancy recombination can be obstructed in the presence of helium, while hydrogen does not actually mean an hydrans. Such a behavior of the helium atoms is very relevant, relevant at temperatures at which vacancy mobility is already activated because of two reasons. On one hand, it could hamper the vacancy shear recombination process at the grain boundary, which could prevent the cell healing um, effect. On the other, if the affinity of the helium atom for the vacancy of the interface, interface is larger than that shown for the interstitial, uh, the helium atom will rather stay inside the vacancy and thus when the number of helium atoms is large enough, it could produce a grain boundary decohesion. Therefore, the main objective of this work is to which extent the presence of helium can hinder the self helium uh, behavior of the interface. Uh, the interface we are working with is the following. It's a tungsten 110112 interface, which is quite interesting since, uh, since it's one of the most experimental thing. It has uh, 456 atoms and is made up of two slabs of six layers, each uh, along the set axis, where the 112 slab has been stretched 1% along the X axis due to the incoherence of the interface. interface. Also, between the two slabs, there is a vacuum of 12 Armstrong, which is indicated uh, here by a yellow line. Uh, the atoms in the two last layers of both slabs has been fixed during, during the relaxation process in order to simulate the recovery of bull-like conditions. One of the advantages of this interface is that the total number of atoms is uh, small enough to be able to study this system with uh, DFT. Uh, the main advantages of the DFT, which is a quantum method, is that it offers a very, very good precision in the calculation. Also, it also has a series of drawbacks, such as high computational cost, it's limited to a few hundred atoms, and temperature cannot be applied. Specifically, in our interface, despite the fact that the number of the total atoms uh, well, uh, it falls within the range of atoms that you are capable of running without much problem with DFT due to the fact that the system has not too much symmetry. It's quite difficult uh, to relax and converge the system, uh, specifically, specifically when we introduce several defects. Uh, for this, one of the most interesting options was to first run the system with MD in order to improve the starting point and then run it with DFT. The main advantages of the MD is that it's a much, much faster method than the DFT. Also, there are another advantages as you can apply temperature into a system. But however, the use of this MD calculation is totally conditioned by the real reliability of the interatomic potential. So the first thing to do is look for a potential that behave, behaves as well as possible in our interface. After testing several potentials, we finally choose a machine learning testing, testing potential that was provided, provided by Peter Grigorev, for which we are extremely grateful, which worked uh, quite well compared to our previous DFT data. The, this potential will allow us to both improve the starting point of the system and then run it with DFT with greater accuracy. And on the other hand, run only with uh, MD in a larger system to which we can apply temperature. Okay, so in this slide, I show you the difference between running directly with DFT and relaxing using an MD and DFT approach. <coughs> Here on the left, I show the initial stage 
in which I place an interstitial atom between the two uh, of the layers of the slab below. At the top, I show the relaxation process using DFT di directly. Specifically, I run this DFT calculation on a computing cluster using 128 CPUs, while the MD ones I did on my own computer. As we can see, what happened is that the interstitial tungsten begins to push an atom from the lattice and so on until the closest one to the interface find the most, most stable position into it. Uh, on the other hand, if we first relax the, with MD, uh, we see how already the final relaxed uh, state with MD describes this process just in a few seconds. And then when I relax with DFT, it's simple, has to find the minimum starting uh, from a much, much better uh, initial configuration. Uh, the graphs on the right clearly show this difference, whereas in the case where the where we have relaxed only with DFT, the DFT software has to take about 60, uh, 65 steps. Meanwhile, in the case we previously relaxed with F, uh, MD, the D DFT only had to take about nine steps. In almost all, all the tests I have done, the time saved in computing time by using MD is quite considerable. considerable. Uh, here I show the time difference between doing it in one way and another, and you can see that we have reduced the computing time by six. In addition, I'm studying the migration barriers of defects with MD. Our intention, well, our intention is in the future refine them with with DFT uh, using the well-known Nudget elastic band method. The NEB is a method for finding the both the atomic configuration and height of the energy barriers associated with a transition state. Here in the image, I show you how it works. The blue atom is also an tungsten atom that I just have indicated another color in blue to differentiate it from the rest. And in the gray spheres correspond to the positions of the interstitial in each of the other state, just for facilitate the visualization. Uh, in this animation, I show you the migration of an interstitial tungsten along the x-axis x at the interface together with this migration barrier graph. The migration will allow us to study if the green boundaries uh, behave simple as a defect store or if, if they will allow the outgassing being, a, being a effective channel diffusions. Finally, we have the helium. Unfortunately, I have not been able to advance with this part yet since we have not found an interatomic potential that perfectly describes the behavior of the helium at the interface. In this image, I show a relaxed configuration directly with DFT in which we have nine atoms along the, along the group of the interface. As you can see, as, you, as can be seen in this comparison, when the relaxation, uh, when we relax the system with MD, the LU arrangement, arrangement flattens out. The difference between both systems is clearly visible. And here I show you some more examples where this flattening can be seen too. Um, therefore, one of the first steps I must take is to continue finding a potential capable, interatomic potential capable of reflecting the behavior uh, of the helium in our interface correctly. Okay, and um, finally the conclusions. Uh, yeah, we have clearly motivated the study of cell healing in nanostructural tungsten under the presence of presence of helium and the use of uh, a combined MD and DFT approach. Uh, once I found the uh, I found the uh, tungsten helium, helium interatomic potential reliable. In our interface, I will study the energetics and structural analysis of the simultaneous presence of helium C and vacancy. And we should, should keep in mind that the motivation to study the different migration barriers <coughs> along the 110112 interface, sorry, uh, is to assess if they may act as an effective diffusion channel 
or it undergoes green boundary decoation instead, which may be ultimately negative and deleterious deter 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 to the to its performance as a plasma fashion materials. And well, as you can see, it's a very, very previous work in progress. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Jorge, for the very nice and clear presentation. I have a question myself. So I know you have tried quite a few interatomic potentials, both for tungsten and for helium. So can you explain a little bit more like which types of potential have you tried? What are the main advantages of one or disadvantages of the other? And why did you decide to go ahead with this potential, with this snap? Uh, I finally choose this, this interatomic potential, for example, in the tungsten tungsten uh, case, because I, I compared the results of uh, DFT that data that we have already in our group. And I and I compare the difference between the the atom positions with uh, the new atom position once we relax with the MD interatomic potential and the and the interatomic potential potential that this this comparison were the smallest one uh, is the one I I choose and also it reproduce all the all the behaviors of of the atoms that DFT does. Okay, sorry. Okay, very good. Now we have a I think very good question from Javier asking if you have tried to perform QMMM simulations on the helium tungsten. Uh, that's what I want to do, and I'm working to do it. Okay, then I have another one myself. So you have shown that if you make a, like a pre-converged relaxation with MD and then you take that to DFT, you get a faster convergence. Do you think it would be possible to make an automatic workflow that you can just use a single input file and yeah. you can do both loops within the same execution? Yeah, because uh, I'm 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 not I'm working on on automata automatize all the all the process but i i'm not already have this automatization then i think i have time for for a last one okay there's one from mary kate so you show plots of energy versus position across the great boundary how can this information be used next can this energy information improve interatomic potentials of green boundaries Okay, wait. Uh, yeah, this is the chat, you can read it. I can also summarize the question, which is just um, also, hi, Jorge. <laughs> um, how do, what, what is the um, value of looking at this? Uh, you mean like this green? The, in the next couple of slides, you show a green plot that has sort of an M shape. Something like this. So, um, how can this energy plot information be used next? What is the value of looking at this um, parameter exactly? To you know if we apply temperature, if the helium, helium or tungsten atoms in the green boundary uh, are able to outgas the interface, or they, or if we apply temperature, they don't have enough. Uh, enough energy to uh, release. I see. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Thank you. OK, so thank you, Jorge, for the presentation. Thank you. I think it's time to move on to the last presentation of the session that will be given by Juan Pablo Balbuena from the University of Alicante. And he will talk about vacancies and self-interstitials migrations in, of chromium in iron chromium alloys. So Juan Pablo, when you are ready. Hi, good morning. I start to share the presentation. One moment. OK. 
Can you see it? Yeah, it's all right. Okay. Well, uh, this presentation is about the use of uh, Kinetic Monte Carlo to model the, the migration of chromium atoms in iron chromium alloys due to the uh, migration of, uh, of point defects. Well, so the main goal of this work uh, was to, to reproduce the, segre the segregation of chromium that takes place in, uh, after irradiating uh, samples of iron chromium. And well, and this put the well, and when they are irradiated, the yeah, what is observed as in these two experiments uh, is that uh, there is um, an enrichment or either depletion uh, of chromium near the green boundaries. And this is an experiment, the one mentioned here in, by uh, Warrior and co workers, where they irradiated a sample of uh, iron chromium, it's called uh, D91, that con uh, contains uh, around 9% uh, of chromium. And then, depending on the temperature, uh, what they observe is uh, a an enrichment or either depletion uh, at the grain boundary. Uh, here on the right side, what they observe, uh, uh, this is the experiment of uh, uh, Gomez Ferrer and co workers. Uh, it's that uh, uh, near the dislocation loops of cell center tissues that appear after irradiating an iron chromium sample, also uh, containing approximately 9% uh, of chromium, and they observe um, decoration of these dislocation loops with, uh, with chromium atoms. So what we are doing is using uh, our Kinetti Monte Carlo uh, model and to reproduce the migration of point effects, but it's also coupled with the um, with um, a segmented ar array uh, of, of cells in, in the simulation domain that contains also the that contains the the solute atoms. I say information about the solute uh, about the solute atoms. Then, depending on the uh, thermodynamics of the systems of the system, and we will have uh, exchanges of uh, chromium atoms between between these cells and. This thermodynamics and the migration is assisted by the what we use is a is a base energy uh, for the migration of either vacancies of, of or interstitials plus uh, an additional term that accounts for the exchange in the free energy of these cells uh, plus um, uh, also one uh, interface energy term that is depicted here that is, is we call it the uh, inhomogeneous term that accounts for the information between the um, not only the two involved cells that are in the interchanging chromium atoms or, or then along with the um, point effects, but also the, the information of the surrounding uh, uh, cells that is also contributing to the, uh, to the energetics of the, the migration. Then, um, uh, regarding the, um, the migration of vacancies, what we have is that uh, um, the okay vacancies are migrating inside the volume. They can migrate within the same cell or either in between the two different cells, uh, interchanging the position with a, um, a iron or either chromium atom. Then what we said, what we said is that uh, when this migration uh, uh, take, takes place with uh, with the change of the position with a chromium atom, then we have the formation of a, a vacancy chromium pair that can also migrate. And in the simulation domain, and also uh, we have uh, the the breakup event of of this uh, of this pair uh, due to the binding energy and also the um, or, and the lifetime of the of the pair that we are taking from information from the literature for the parameters. The, then uh, so uh, we run in uh, different. Uh, Simulations also uh, initially uh, aimed to reproduce the segregation of chromium uh, that took place in the experiment of uh, Novi and co workers, where they used a sample of iron chromium with a 20% of chromium that was annealed at uh, 500 uh, Celsius degrees. And they observed as a function of the time and that they were uh, getting a precipitates of chromium. Okay, and this plot here, I'm showing the here at the, at the lower part of this plot. Um, hang on a second. I don't think that's in. okay. Here on the lower part of this uh, of this graph, we have the concentration of chromium in the bulk. M meanwhile, in this other part of the plot, we have the concentration of chromium in the precipitates. Well, but we model so we run the simulation for different cell sizes, as you can see here. 
and also here on this plot, and to see that the, the simulation was also that was success. But also we trust uh, also other uh, temperatures uh, to see that the precipitation was not something that was uh, uh, only happening for that. That would be an artifact and so on. So. Uh, and what we observe is that the precipitation is not taking place for higher temperatures because uh, in the phase diagram of iron chromium, uh, especially for these temperatures, uh, the higher temperatures, then the 20% of chromium is stable. And it's not producing uh, uh, precipitates. Well, uh, we finally, and uh, very recently, introduced the, also the migration uh, of chromium assisted by in surface texture. And this case is more complex as it depends on the three involved particles that we are considering. Uh, first, and uh, the two, the, so the nature of the two atoms but, uh, uh, becoming part of the dumbbell or the, of the cell interstitial. And also the, so actually is one of them, the one that is migrating towards another position and then uh, uh, forming another dumbbell. So we are considering uh, also the, uh, the eight possible configuration considering these three, the nature of these three atoms. So we're here on this side, on this left side of this picture, I'm showing the, the different cases for the, so when the migration, uh, so when the actual atom that is migrating, it's an, it's an iron, then for, uh, initially having a, uh, a dumbbell in the initial position and then forming another one in the last position. And it's also uh, using the same kinetics or energetics than uh, shown previously, but in the case of the base energy, when you the ones that were reported uh, by uh, the work of also and co-workers that uh, are listed here. So, uh, in this slide, I'm showing some of the uh, preliminary results that we obtained uh, regarding the kinetics of the system uh, uh, to see if we could either, um, and, well, well, if we could, uh, if we would obtain either enrichment or precipitations, yes, with uh, well, some information about this, uh, following the same. Uh, uh, transport parameter obtained by machine and co-workers. The, the we, we are, uh, what they were showing here is the uh, partial diffusion coefficient ratio uh, when for, uh, for migration of vacancies for different concentrations. Uh, also the same for the migration of, uh, of cells interstitials and then a combination of both. And just to check yeah, in a first instance if we would uh, lead to depletion or either enrichment in the sample. Uh, after and in obtaining this plus, what we did was uh, irradiating uh, uh, these location loops to see if we could obtain either enrichment or depletion, but uh, we didn't obtain any noticeable difference. Then what we did was uh, irradiating separately uh, vacancies only and then interstitials only, and to see if we could appreciate any any difference. So we run simulations um, shown here with different cell sizes. Well the, 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 well, the cell size is, is, is uh, five times the largest parameter in, in both cells. But with this uh, size of the whole bone, um, using a dislocation loop as a sink and irradiating with only self interstitial, then the dislocation loop that is made of uh, self interstitial is uh, growing. Um, but in the, in, and here on the other side, what we, what we did was irradiating a dislocation loop. And with only vacancies, and so its size uh, decreases. And we, did, we couldn't appreciate any, any of these parameters. Maybe it's due to because the, and in the experiments, the, well, the, the doses are much higher than, one, than the one uh, we use in this simulation. And we, well, what we did next was a, a try to model the, 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 to see if we can reproduce the enrichment or the depletion near a green boundary. So we model the green boundary in our domain as, a, as an array of empty cells. And we also run the simulations where this uh, uh, volume were for different coming concentrations and different temperatures as usual. And then also the, with initially with only vacancies, then all interstitial, and then finally with uh, Franklin pairs, with this uh, uh, flux and, and, and rich flux. Those. Then, and 
Here in this plot, I'm showing the results for the cases of uh, initial concentration of 5% of chromium and 15% of chromium. Uh, the 5% of chromium on, on the uh, upper part of the slide and 15% in the lower part. Well, uh, when we irradiated the, the sample with uh, only vacancies, what we obtain is a, is, well, it's an enrichment uh, near the, the model grain boundary with empty cells. And, and meanwhile, where we irradiated with all in self interstitia, we obtain a depletion. Uh, and then also the Franco is uh, the combination of both. Well, actually, but actually uh, running with uh, simulating the introduction of, uh, of, of point effects. Well, these are the results we, are, we obtained uh, last week. I still, uh, still haven't the, the time to think about this too much because um, initially I was expecting uh, quite the opposite. Uh, well, irradiating with a uh, vacancy, I would expect uh, depletion, not enrichment and so on. Maybe, well, we are thinking about this. Uh, maybe it's due to the, uh, the nature of the grain boundary where we are using. That is an artifact. It's an array of empty, empty cells, and that could be affecting the, the kinetics of the system. Because it's using also the, 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 concentr the chromic concentration of the surrounding uh, areas. Well, as a summary, we have presented a model based on, uh, on object genetic Monte Carlo to reproduce the segregation of chromium in our terminal loads. And the, we are using, well, we are explicitly used the formation of uh, beta chromium pairs and that can migrate by themselves. And they also have the, the breakup event and a breakup event and so on. But in the case of uh, uh, surface tissue, chromium pairs, uh, the that the pearl is actually something implicit and in the in, in the migration uh, uh, depending on the nature of the involved particles then we have uh, run a first set of simulation results for oh no uh, simulations and where the results with the delocation loop didn't, didn't uh, show any enrichment or either depletion and it might be due to the to the doses, because in the experiment it's the uh, it's uh, around uh, uh, 15 dBA, and and also then in the case of grain boundaries we obtain the enrichment and depletion, but uh, we are well uh, we had to still to still to think about this because may maybe that way of modeling a grain boundary is not the right one and it might be a feature so uh, instead of uh, due to the this artifact. So additional, uh, additional studies are needed to, uh, to, to keep on working on this the idea. Well, uh, that's all. Uh, many thanks. Many thanks for your attention. Thanks, Juan Pablo, for the presentation. We have some time now for questions. I, I see, I don't know, this is not a hand up, no? No, it's just a clap. So yeah, I have a question myself. I'm not an expert in OKMC, but Question is how how your model does take into account the interaction between between vacancies like D vacancies or vacancy clusters or okay do you take the energetics of you know, the, the binding energy between vacancies or how does it work and can you see like vacancy and interstitial recombination? Yeah, uh, all of uh, both are everything is is included. Also the the formation of. Uh, uh, of cluster can take place, but uh, we are introducing the the point effects one by one, so that uh, the um, uh, formation of clusters and, and voids and so on are not taking place. The, the idea initially is to model the and uh, to reproduce the behavior uh, of with the uh, with only just point effects uh, inserted one by one, so they cannot produce a, a, a more complex configurations, and then. And, and run uh, simulations of, uh, um, in, uh, as usual, they're like in, uh, well, introducing a full cascades of defects uh, due to MEV, so the uh, ions with MEV energy, energy and so on, and then uh, let the system evolve and, and see what happens. But, but, but first, uh, first we need to be sure that the ingredients are, are working as expected. Okay, and then we have a question here from Javier. So he says that iron-9-chromium samples are usually analyzed in experiments. 
One can notice that chromium, that chromium can slow down the mobility of this yeah, location right. in comparison to pure iron. Have you taken a look into this mechanism? Yeah, the chromium is slowing down the mobility of the location loops. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, that's a way to model chromium as an agree alloy uh, simply by simply reducing the mobility of uh, this location of uh, of one 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 this location loops that the location with one, one word orientation, and the one introduced there is a one oh oh that is uh, um, well it's immobile in, in mobile uh, at least at the temperature we are considering. And yeah, we want what we want is to avoid the use of a gray alloy model and also to uh, modeling the well, well to see the, the formation of precipitate, uh, precipitates along with this uh, slowdown of the uh, the mobility of, of mobile dislocation loops. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have also a question here from Roberto Iglesias. Are you interested in eventually coming to model solute clusters? Solute. With copper, for example, or other species. Carbon. Sorry, copper. Uh, yeah, so, copper. yeah, we have uh, already a working model. Well, we were also using the gray alloy model as, along with the uh, carbon impurities that are used to slow to, uh, to trap uh, mobile dislocation loops. And um, other things, and yeah, we, it, that's the roadmap. <laughs> it's in our roadmap. Okay, and then I think I have time for a very last question. If there is no more from people, so can you please give an estimation on the computational cost of the simulations, or how big can you make systems? How long can you let them evolve in time, and so on? War. Uh, the largest we run in our cluster, it's uh, to model uh, 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 full cascades of one MeV. It's uh, 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer on the surface, on the surface, and then uh, 900 uh, nanometers. I don't think we can go. Well, it's something to, to try, but uh, that's in, in that order of. Um, Magnitude more or less. Okay, thanks very much. So Thank I think that's everything. I don't see any other questions. So I think we can close the session now. So thank you, Juan Pablo, and thank you to all the speakers to this session. We have a coffee break now of about 20 minutes, and we'll be back here at 10 past 11. So thank you very much. Dr. Anis Kuli, I don't know if I pronounce well, from the Department of Physics at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. And Dr. Kuli will present global geokinetic simulations of electrostatic microturbulent uh, transport using kinetic electrons in LHD accelerator. So the floor is yours. Dr. Cully, you have 50 minutes. Please keep the timing. Uh, can you see the screen in the full screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present our work. So uh, I want to talk about this, uh, the global simulations uh, uh, using the kinetic electrons in LHD accelerator. So this result that I'm going to present, this is all in the electrostatic limit, but uh, this result that I'm going to present is a global simulation. So this is one of the first you know, global gyrokinetic simulations, which is carried out in stellarator geometry using the kinetic electrons. So let me try to give some uh, you know, overview about this equilibrium in the LHD uh, system. So, uh, you know, LSD is a 3D geometry system. So the code that we are using, you know, to simulate uh, this microturbulence transport that we are using, it's called the GTC, it's called the global toroidal code. 
I mean, it can handle uh, axis symmetric as well as the non-axis symmetric equilibrium. And for this particular case, we are using the non-axis symmetric equilibrium and that has been generated by uh, this uh, VMAT code, this MHD code. And so after this equilibrium, whatever we have, so in this equilibrium that is provided by this VMAC, so it provides the, you know, the equilibrium in Fourier series in both colloidal and in the toroidal direction on a discrete radial mesh. And, you know, in the toroidal parts, it is equidistant. Okay. So basically with this information that we have from this VMAC, what we did, you know, we transformed this data to the Boozer coordinates because the GTC is, so it's a flux, you know, that is basically is currently running in the flux coordinates in Boozer coordinates. So we transform this data that we have from the VMAC to the Boozer coordinate. And this is basically the equilibrium magnetic field for a given theta psi and the zeta. Zeta is basically the toroidal directions. And these are the, you know, the components of the Fourier uh, components is that this is the cosine component and this is the sine component. So with the help of this information from the VMAC, we can basically you know, generate this magnetic field in the Boozer coordinate. And here, this A is represent the toroidal harmonic number. And so yesterday, there are a couple of talks about this periodicity in the stellarator system. So you all know that you know, the LHD also has a field period of 10. So basically, that means that you know, the, all the equilibrium quantities in this stellarator, uh, this LHT, you know, so they have a periodicity of two pi by chain in the toroidal directions. So this is basically uh, the magnetic field topology that we have from the LHT for a given flux surface. Now, because of the special periodicity of chain that we have here, so we will have the chain dip to a eigenmode families corresponding to this chain field period for this turbulence transport. So this is basically the equilibrium that we have, you know, uh, you know, uh, constructed for our uh, GPC code in the Buzar coordinate. So uh, as I mentioned you that, you know, we have done this global gyrokinetic simulations using the kinetic electron. Uh, so let me try to give you some overview about the, uh, the simulation model that we have incorporated uh, you know, for doing this telerator simulation using the kinetic electron. So GPC is a, you know, it's a global toroidal code adding the gyrokinetic code. So now the thing is that in this case, we basically solve or evolve this particle dynamics in five dimensional phase space. And so this is basically, you can see, this is the, the dynamical equations, the gyrokinetic glass of equations and the corresponding dynamical equation of the position and the velocities in the parallel directions. So with this five dimensional phase space, you can basically get the information about the phase space at every child. Now for the ion, you know, in this uh, simulation, we have carried out these simulations using the Delta F method for better, you know, numerical convergence. So what we did, we basically, uh, you know, put this equilibrium into two parts. One is the equilibrium part, Another one is the departure part from this equilibrium that is F0. So now with the help of this information, you know, you can easily calculate this corresponding contributions of the ion, uh, the fluctuations. Now for the electron, you know, the model that we have incorporated in GTC is much more different than the ion because of its special nature. So what we did in electron, actually we have separated this uh, total distribution in three parts rather than the two parts. So if you see the electron distributions have the equilibrium part, that is the Maxwellian, and you know the major part of the perturbations is nothing but the adiabatic that we call the lowest order contributions. And you know, so there is the trapped fractions, you know, of these kinetic electrons. So all the trapped fractions of the kinetic electron that we are considering through this delta AG. So that we are considering the higher order contributions. So this is the lowest order and this is the higher order contributions. Now, once we have this lowest order contribution, this adiabatic model, so what we did, we basically solved these gyrokinetic Poisson's equations. So if we see, you know, when you are taking this gyrokinetic Poisson's equation in the lowest order, so what will happen? You are basically having only the adiabatic contribution, you do not have any kinetic contributions. 
So basically you can write down this gyrokinetic Poisson's equation in the lowest order. So on the right hand side, you have only the contribution of fluctuation of the ion density. And this curly one is the zonal component. And this electron contribution, which is coming due to this adiabatic nature of this electron, we have taken on the left hand side of the Poisson's equation. This one is basically is contributing to that part. Now, if you solve this equation, it will give you the lowest order, the fluctuation, electrostatic fluctuation associated with that mode. Now, once we have this uh, lowest order fluctuation of that mode, then what we can do, we basically solve this kinetic hybrid electron model. So this is basically this uh, kinetic hybrid electron model. And this is basically the evolution of the waves due to these higher order corrections. Now, so in this equation, you see that the higher order correction is based on the lowest order contributions of the electrostatic potentials. And we basically evolve this according to the trapped fractions, which is present in the system. And from this lowest order of this electrostatic potential, you can go to the higher order by the iterative one. And depending on the trapped fractions, how many iterations that you need from this lowest order to the higher order. So basically, if you see that, you know, like we have this distribution also have this lowest order and the higher order. Similarly, you know, when we have the electrostatic potential, so that we also have the lowest order contributions, which is coming from the adiabatic contributions of the electrons and the higher order contributions, which is coming due to the trapped fractions on the electron. So, so this is the model that we have implemented uh, in our code. And after that, what we did, we have verified this global ITG mode. So what we did, we first verify this, you know, pure ITG mode. So what I mean by pure is that, you know, we made the other profiles to be flattened, except this ion temperature gradient. So if you have a finite ion temperature gradient, that will give you the finite, you know, this mode. And that is basically the, this linear ITG. You can see that the mode structure is localized on the outer lead plane, and this is elongated along the field line. So if you come to this 3D field line direction, so if you can see that this mode is elongated along the field line directions, and when you reach to the, because we want to calculate the turbulence transport, so we carried out the nonlinear simulations. And in the nonlinear simulations, you can find that, you know, this mode, you know, all the different mode numbers, they have started interacting with each other, exchanging energies, and they break into small eddies. This is the, you can see, this is the small eddies is breaking too. So now we have seen that what is the effect of the zonal flow on these things. And you can see that, you know, zonal flow, and, you know, creating a, uh, this regulating the turbulence transport, you know, it's splitting into small eddies, you know, with the help of the zonal flow. If you see, it breaks into small eddies. So basically what we see that, you know, from this 3D uh, panel that, you know, the mode which is elongated, it was big structure, but when we went to the nonlinear phase in the presence of the zonal flow, it, you know, split it into small structure. Now, you know, the mode structure that we see in the outer mid plane, this is quite similar to the, the ITG mode that usually observed in Chokala. So now let's come to some nonlinear properties associated with that one. So we have considered only the ion temperature gradient. So usually you can expect the heat transport associated with that one. And this is basically the, the uh, uh, corresponding quantity, the time variation of the heat transport. Now, the thing is that in this simulation, what we did, we considered the effect of the kinetic electron. And you know, the kinetic electron basically increased the ITG growth rate. And also, the once you introduce the kinetic electron, so it will reduce the zonal flow. So eventually it will hence, you know, increase the ITG turbulence transport. Now, in also like that, what we observed from the previous figure, like the zonal flow plays a very important role in regulating the the turbulence transport. So you can see that in the presence of this zonal flow, the turbulence is level is goes down. So it's basically regulating the transport, uh, you know. So zonal flow play a big important role in ITG transport uh, level. So now let's try to understand this uh, spectrum also. So in the linear, in the linear phase, you can this blue line, you can see. So the mode is localized and you know, the width is very narrow. So of the order of say delta in of the order of 20. But you know, when we are going to the nonlinear phase of these simulations, we found that you know this mode is going to the you know going to the low in number. 
So it's cascading in the uh, inverse directions. So secondly, you know, what we did, we carry out the simulation for the trapped electron mode. That is also pure TEM we have carried out. So for doing, doing that one, we made the other profiles to be flat and accept this the gradient in the ion temperature. So because of this finite gradient, you can expect there will be some mode which is growing in chai. So that is basically, you can see that the mode is growing on chai on the outer mid plane, similar to the total neck behavior. And also what we did, we carried out the simulations in the nonlinear phase. And you can see that in the presence of the zonal flow and without zonal flow, so it does not affect, so, sorry, I think we are in the wrong slide, sorry, sorry. So this is the, the slide for this TEM mode. So you can see that TEM is mode is, uh, you know, localized in the outer mid plane. And also you can see in the nonlinear simulation domains of mode, you know, they started interacting with each other and, you know, split it into small uh, ADs over here. But you know, the most important part here is that you know, in the presence of the zonal flow and in the absence of the zonal flow, so there is not that much effect. You can see by looking this mode structure in the ADs, it does not affect that much. So this is basically the thing is that the zonal flow is not being the, that much contributions in the regulations of the TEA mode. And this is very well-known phenomena in the tokamak and in Stellarator also, we find the similar observations. So now let's come to some the transport quantities. So since we have only the, as I mentioned you, that we have only the, the, the density gradient that we have for these simulations. So, you know, you can easily expect this ion particle transport in the presence of that one. So you can see that, you know, uh, from the previous figure that, you know, so turbulence is spreading over the entire, you know, entire domain and, you know, it is uh, you know, breaking into small part, but the you know, effect of the zonal flow was not there. So we have, you know, calculate those quantities. So this is basically, you know, the ion transport coefficient, if you see it there. So you can see that the effect of the zonal flow that is in the dotted line and the solid line is very small. So the effect is almost not there. So then what is the, the reason for the mechanism of the saturations of this idea, this TEM transport? So to understand that, you know, what we did, we carried out this, uh, this uh, you know, spectral analysis and we found that you know, in the linear simulations, so more this narrow localized with a certain range of this game that you can see by this blue line. But when we are going to the nonlinear phase, you know, this mode is going inverse cascading to you know, very low AM and in numbers. So basically all the energies are going to this low AM and in numbers. So as a result of that, so this is the main mechanism for the saturations of this uh, you know, TEM turbulence in the nonlinear stage. So uh, this is the final slide. I will, uh, so if you uh, remember that in the last two cases, what we did, either we consider you know, the pure T ITG or pure TEM. So basically what we did in one case, we have removed the density gradient. In another case, we have removed the temperature gradient. Now to understand, because in the system, we have both the gradients are present, right? So what we did, we carried out the simulations with both the gradients with the similar amount. So basically the eta is of the order of one. So now if you have, this is one, then what will happen, you know, we studied these calculations and we found this, uh, you know, the mode which is dominant is actually propagating in the ion diamagnetic directions. So this is basically an ITG mode. And another important thing, the volume average ion diffusivity and conductivity. So basically this uh, black line, if you see dotted and the solid, you can see that they are almost of the same order. So basically the volume average ion diffusivity and the conductivity almost same in both the cases. Now, one of the important things is that, you know, when we go to this eta is equal to in this infinity case, that is basically the ITT case, what we found the sky I, right? That is the highest one. But you know, when we, uh, the simulations with this only with the density gradient, so that is basically the DI, the ion, diffusivity, what we found, that is the lowest. So basically, you know, for this particular configuration and the profile that we have for this LSD stellarator, we can say that in the present scenario, the plasma profile gradient, the ITG turbulence acts as the primary drive for the heat conductivity transport, but why the TEM turbulence will behave for the effective for this ion particle uh, diffusivity. So this is the main message that we uh, want to give. 
so that the we as basically achieve this you know global simulation in the presence of kinetic electrons and you know so the what are the the corresponding transport level in the electrostatic limit okay so i will stop it here okay thank you very much for your talk very interesting talk so we have time for questions now I don't see question in the audience. I have a question myself. You have shown that for eta i infinity, the kinetic electrons increase the growth rate of the ITG mode and also the heat transport due to the reduction of the standard flow. My question is what happened in the eta i one case? Do the kinetic electrons increase the growth rate? Well, uh, so this uh, idea is that, you know, if principally if you, uh, yeah, this ITG growth rate should increase, right? So, but the thing is that, you know, for this particular, I mean, that we all know from the normal analysis that we have, but for this particular case that, uh, you know, this, this configuration that we have, so they both are at the same level. So that is a little bit, uh, you know, surprising to us also that you know for this particular configuration you know there is like both itg and dm you know they are at the similar level yeah. of transport so this yeah. may be it's particular for this particular you know the configurations or maybe the profile that we have mm -hmm. and with respect to the to this case also yeah. in this case I, the itg should be mm, almost in the in the threshold of of instability, isn't it? For eta i equal one. So the I'm surprised because of the the growth rate. And because well, uh, the yeah, dominant so, mode is ITG, you say. But yeah. in this case, I think you are very close to the threshold. Yes, 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 yes. So that's true. That's true. So it's a strange that the growth rate is so, so large, isn't yes. it? Yes. So and you what's can see the from, explanation from this? So, 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 so basically you can see that, you know, if you see that the growth rate of this one, they, this is basically the ITG case, right? That yeah. we are talking about. So this is higher than the rate one. So that is true. So, but as I told you, this is the, you know, pure case, right? You know, this is a pure ITG case and this is a pure TM case. But when we are considering both of them, so you can see that growth rate are of the order of similar. So, you know, they are on the top of each other. But how can you see the growth rate there? I, I would look at the slope of this curve, and the slope yes. is larger for the for the black one, isn't it? Yes. So this uh, so so this is like you know growth rate. You can say a little bit lower than this one. So this part you know so it is a little bit uh, you know still uh, confusing for us that you know why it is happening. This may be you know some some surprising that you know that this happened uh, in this particular case. Normally, in other scenario, when we run with that one, we can clearly distinguish between these two things. But here, it's like that. You know, it's very difficult to distinguish between these two cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I think we don't have any more questions in the audience, so we can go for the next talk. Thank you very much for this interesting okay. talk. And the next speaker is. Christos Bakidis from the University of Stuttgart and will present full wave simulations of four microwave plasma interaction. Uh, Christos, I don't know if you are yes. ready. And you yeah, have yeah, 15 minutes and you can start whenever you want. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Okay. Hello everyone, thank you very much for attending my talk. Um, I will be talking about finite difference time domain full wave simulations for microwave plasma interactions. Here is the overview of my talk. I will be starting with uh, some motivation why we're interested in uh, studying the interaction between microwaves and plasmas. Then I will briefly introduce the G algorithm, which is the basis of my code. Then I will uh, describe the code uh, itself, some more details about it, the code that I'm using and developing. And then I will address some of the challenges that I faced during the code development. And finally, I will discuss some selected uh, results that I have. Okay, so uh, 
Microwaves are widely used in plasma applications, including, of course, uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, for example, they can be used as diagnostic tools, as interferometry, which is one that I am doing. Um, interferometry is a diagnostic technique that can be used to measure the line integrated electron density of the plasma. Um, here in figure one, we can see a very simple sketch of, interfer of an interferometer. The idea is basically that we, you have a microwave that is probing the plasma, uh, here assuming that the gray ball is the plasma, and a similar wave that's propagating into the free space. And they, these two uh, waves are mixed in a phase detector here. And there is a phase difference in between these two waves because uh, uh, the plasma has a different refractive index, of course. So the wave that goes through the plasma is offering a phase shift. And this phase difference can yield the line integrated density. Now, what I want to do with the assistance of the full wave simulations is to not only get the line integrated density from interferometry, but also the full profile of the plasma, especially if it's an inhomogeneous plasma, as I will show. Uh, apart from diagnostic tools, they can also, the microwaves can also be used as heating mechanisms in nuclear fusion devices. For example, here in figure two, I have the, the plasma column of the W7 accelerator device. And as we can see, among other ports, there are also two ports for ECRH heating. Um, so the Yi algorithm, as first introduced by Yi uh, in, the, in the 60s, basically solves the Faraday's law for the magnetic field and the Ampere's law for the, elect the electric field. Um, the idea is here to replace the derivatives with unique differences in order to discretize space and time. And by doing that, you can involve uh, the fields with a leapfrog method, which means that um, you can get, for example, if we look at figure three here, if you want to get the BX component, which is here at the center, the only thing you need is the BX at the previous time step, time step plus the four surrounding electric field nodes. Uh, this can also be seen here in the equation. We have BX that is here the exponent of the time step, essentially. This is the future field. And inside the parentheses are the spatial coordinates. And in order to get that, you need the BX at the previous time step plus the four surrounding electric field nodes. Uh, the ratio here is that delta T over delta is basically the ratio of the, the, four, the the time step uh, uh, divided by a special step. It is a very important quantity for the stability of the code, as I will show later. So the finite difference time domain code is a 2D version written in C. And as I said, it's based on the E algorithms. It solves two of the uh, Maxwell's equations, as I demonstrated, plus the current density equation for the electrons, uh, which accounts basically for the plasma effects. Here, the last term on the right-hand side, uh, which is the cross product between the current density and the background magnetic field can be neglected because I want to simulate an unmagnetized plasma. Uh, and the first term on the right-hand side is the plasma frequency. And the, the plasma frequency, of course, contains the electron density. And the electron density can be of arbitrary shape. And this gives us a nice flexibility that we can simulate uh, many different plasma profiles. Now, this code is not published somewhere, but it's a very a similar code to the IPF FDMC, which is a code um, that's used for mode conversion. Some more details about the code. As I said, the stability criterion of a 2D domain is basically the speed of light times the, uh, times the time step has to be smaller or equal to 1 over dx squared plus 1 over dy squared uh, in the power of uh, 1 minus uh, 2. Um, in order to fulfill this requirement for the code to be stable uh, so that the fields uh, are not evolving too much between two different uh, grid sites, grid points, um, I'm using delta t over delta equal to 1 over 2c. And delta here is the dx of, uh, is assuming to be the same special step for the two directions, e and y. Um, the computational grid that I want to simulate is quite big. It's 50 times 38, um, the wavelength, basically. And the wavelength that I'm using is 1.441 millimeters, which corresponds to 208 gigahertz. And this is a quite high frequency because um, the density of the plasma that I, I have in the experiment that I will actually show in the next slide uh, has quite high density. So we want to ensure that we are above the cutoff frequency. Uh, in order to be fast with these uh, calculations, the code is OpenMP parallelized to keep the experimental relevance. Uh, here in this uh, simple table, we can see that uh, when I don't have parallelization, the code needs about 20 minutes to run, while when I increase it two threads, then we have need basically half the time. But then when we see that when we double the threads, we don't have half the time every time, and that's because the, uh, the parallelization is not perfect, so yeah, this needs to be fixed at some point in the future. But still, if you use four threads, 
uh, significantly better than no parallelization, basically. So uh, this is the experimental setup. It's basically an atmospheric plasma, which is confined in a glass quartz tube, as we can see here in figure five, where it's ignited. Uh, the quartz tube and the plasma is inside a, a resonator, which has uh, some metallic plates and pillars here. This ensures that the microwaves that are used to ignite the plasma cannot escape and they go only inside the plasma. Now, as I said in the beginning, I want to uh, design a new interferometry technique, which will give us not only the line integrated density, but also the full uh, plasma profile. Uh, here in figure four, we can see the antennas of the interferometer. From this side is uh, the sending antenna where the wave is uh, exiting and is going through the plasma. And on the other side, there is a bented antenna. It's in figure six, we can see it better here. This is the, uh, the receiving antenna of the interferometer. And basically the idea is to use a stepping motor, which is, this is basically this device here on the right hand side of figure four, which can be moved in one D direction as the green arrow indicates here. And basically the idea is to measure the intensity of the wave electric field. And because the microwave will be scattered due to the interaction with the plasma, this scattering uh, depends both on the peak density and also on the plasma profile. And if we compare this um, intensity of the wave electric field to the simulations, then we can deduce information on the actual plasma state. So let's go back to the simulations. The first thing we, we need to do is of course to excite the microwave. And I want to do that inside two waveguides to, as I have in the, in the experiment, these waveguides essentially act as a sending antenna. I do that by simulating them as perfect electric conductors or PECs. And for the T, for a 2D T mode propagation, we only have a BZ component of the magnetic field. The other components are vanishing. And for every BZ component that, are, that falls inside the PEC, basically the four surrounding electric field nodes are setting to zero. And this, we can see here that it works. The, the wave is uh, basically reflected inside the waveguides, and then it's exiting and propagating into free space, essentially. Um, here in this red line is where the receiving antenna plane is uh, located. And here we measure the intensity of the wave electric field. And we can see here that we have a pretty much a Gaussian signal. It's not a perfectly Gaussian signal. And this is due to the fact that we have these reflections here. If you had only free space propagation, then this would be a perfect Gaussian signal. Uh, the next part, probably the most important part, is of course to uh, include the plasma through the current density equation, as I demonstrated. Uh, in this case, we have a simple 2D Gaussian distribution, and we can immediately notice that when we have the plasma and the, the waves interacting with the plasma is uh, strongly scattered. And now we can see here in uh, the receiving antenna plane that um, uh, we have two discrete peaks, left and right of the plasma, and also uh, some small uh, side peaks. Um, the, the next part would be to include also the glass quartz tube, the dielectric, because it's quite important. As I showed in the experiment, uh, the plasma is confined in there, so we need this as well in the simulations. And in order to do that, we basically can locate where the, the quartz tube is and change the relative permittivity there. And um, we can see that uh, here, where we have the interaction between the wave and the quartz tube, we have some internal reflections, some uh, Fabry Perot in the perimeter behavior. And also on the other side, uh, we see some uh, interaction going on. And this leads to some um, perturbation of the signal. As we can see now, we don't have the two discrete peaks, but we have uh, disform a small disformation here. And also, uh, even at the center where we had a very perf a perfectly uh, deep here, now we have some sort of perturbation. Here we can see a better comparison between the three different cases. In figure 10, we have the unperturbed microwave beam where we have the Gaussian shape. Then we have the interaction with the plasma, which leads to a very strong scattering as we saw. And finally, the figure 12 has the case where we have also the quartz tube and we see some perturbation of the signal here. In order to test the validity of the code, I use the Compson Multiphysics software uh, to compare against my code. Uh, here, these results in figure 13 and 14 are without the waveguides because I didn't have the time to implement them in console yet. I'm using the same maximum density, 2 times 10 to the power of 20. Uh, this is a quite high density, as we can see, if we normalize to the cutoff density, 0 0.37, but it is a, a realistic density for the experiment. 
we can see that we have in both cases here in figure 13 is without the quartz cube and we have um, a good agreement uh, for the most part the results are matching except from these uh, side peaks that are not being predicted by the analytical code uh, in figure 14, we can see the, the quartz tube also is included here. And um, we see that the effect of the quartz in the analytical code is a bit stronger. We have a small deformation here. And there's also a small uh, peak, a very small peak here in the center, which is kind of predicted by both. Uh, and in the previous case, um, the aluminum plates of the resonator are not included here. Um, if we compare against the experimental result, we see that we don't have a very, very good agreement. The experimental result is way more uh, noisy. As we can see here, there are very um, many more additional peaks. Um, this is probably the most important part is, of course, that in the experiment, we also have these aluminum pillars and plates that they can induce uh, very strong uh, beam reflections and are being detected by the receiving antenna, which uh, they, they don't basically exist. In the, in the code. Um, also, uh, of course, we are scanning a 1D direction in the experiment, but um, the real world of course is 3D. So uh, even though we don't want to detect them, we detect more signals coming from not only different horizontal angles, but also different vertical angles. And because the definite difference code is uh, 2D, basically it's impossible to get this here. So, yeah, here we have more information that we simply cannot predict with a 2D code. Uh, of course, we can see that we have a, a similar beam scattering. It's a, a clear that even in the experiment, the beam is scattered. Uh, but yes, we don't get the full information with the code yet. Uh, to summarize the work and suggest some possible future work, a 2D finite difference time domain code has been uh, successfully applied to simulate micro beam propagation to plasma that is confined in a glass quartz tube. Uh, we saw that for a high peak density, uh, we have a very strong uh, beam scattering due to the interaction of the macro and the plasma. Uh, we saw that when we include the quartz tube, then there is some extra beam reflections which uh, perturb the signal a bit more. Uh, we saw that a comparison against the COMSOL multiphysics software demonstrates that the code is um, behaving relatively well in describing the interaction between the microwave and the plasma and the quartz, but we are not in, uh, in a position now to successfully predict the experimental result. Uh, in order to do so, we either need to include the aluminum pillars and plates to match the experimental result, or we can also remove this noise from the experimental signal because, of course, we can measure um, without the plasma to see uh, the, the noise that we have due to the, the resonator, the, the geometry, and then subtract that from the result with the plasma. Uh, we can then explore more plasma profiles. As I said, the, the density in the code is arbitrary set, so we can uh, select basically not just a Gaussian distribution, but maybe a top hat distribution or a super Gaussian or whatever to see which uh, result will give us what we see in the experiment. Uh, at some point, of course, we need to extend the code to 3D, even though this will be more computationally demanding, but we need to do it so that we can get a better picture of what's going on in the real world. And finally, we need to uh, extend this work and apply this numerical model to the TJK accelerator device, uh, which is located in Stuttgart. I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for your presentation, Christos, uh, and for the perfect timing. Mm -hmm. Now we have time for questions. I don't know if we have in the audience. Maybe I missed something in your presentation. I think you said that you consider a non-magnetized plasma, isn't it? which seems uh, to be a strong simplification for fusion plasma. Uh, yes, the, indeed, yes. Uh, yeah, but um, at the moment, I'm trying to implement this in an atmospheric plasma, which is unmagnetized. Of course, if you want to, obviously, you can you use full wave simulations of fusion plasma as well. And the background magnetic field can also be set arbitrary. But I, I don't do it yet. But when uh, we move to the TJK, uh, of course, I will need to include that as well. OK. And uh, you mentioned that uh, 
possible implications are the interferometry diagnosis and, and also heating. I wonder mm, yes. if this should be applicable also for reflectometry diagnostics, isn't it? This is not considered? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Um, you can do it. I, yeah, I think you can use full wave simulation for reflectometry as well. It's okay, not the exact, they don't work exactly the same way, but yeah, it's similar there. You just get the reflection so you can uh, calculate the cutoff density. Yeah, I haven't tried it to, to be honest, but uh, yeah, for example, when if I uh, increase, for example, if I set the density, I did it just to test it where is it um, uh, here beyond one, then you can see that the wave is reflected. So I guess, yeah, you can easily uh, apply that to reflectometry as well. Actually, there was an initiative to develop a full wave code for uh, reflectometry, I think, in Fusion. Mm -hmm. I don't know how this code compare with that initiative, if you can comment on this. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I, I can accept it to, to do a comparison. Okay. And uh, from your presentation, I, I, I think you are running the code in just one node, isn't it? Uh, I'm using uh, mostly four threads usually, and um, yeah, because it's not. And this is within one node, isn't it? No. Yes, yes, it's in one node. Yeah. And when you go to three D, what are the expectations with respect to with to computational resources required by the code? You will need more nodes, more computational. Uh, uh, well, it, it will definitely be more expensive. Uh, I'm thinking to start with probably a smaller grid to reduce the dimensions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how uh, more how much more time I will be need to be honest. Because I haven't tried it, but I expect it to be uh, quite uh, harder there. And there are probably I need to fix the parallelization so that to be more efficient, I guess. But yeah, I don't really know how much time it will be needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we don't have any more questions. I don't have more questions myself. So thank you very much for your, your talk, very clear talk. And thank you all the people that uh, made presentations in this session. Thank you for attending the session. Now we have a break for lunch. So we will continue in one and a half hour at 13.40. I'll see you later and bon appetit. Next speaker is uh, Pablo, Pablo Oyola, Mr. Pablo Oyola. He's going to present the work of uh, mega mega code related work for TCB tokamak pablo would you unmute microphone and start yeah i allow me to share my screen and maybe you can start now i hope you can hear me properly yeah okay and now you can see the slide right yes perfect so thank you professor Shinpei, for the kind introduction and Yes, I'm going to uh, give you a brief talk of some of my latest results on the fast ion transport and losses that are uh, negative triangularity in the TCV talk. As Jesus, I would like to give uh, uh, thanks to all my co-authors and yeah, I would like now to just to start right away. Now, uh, probably most of you or some of you doesn't uh, is not aware, but negative triangularity has been posed as a uh, uh, relevant, uh, relevant uh, scenario for future, future uh, fusion devices and also future, future uh, power plants. And it was first observed in the TCV tokamak that a strong reduction of the heat flux occurred when going from positive triangularity to negative triangularity. And to um, indicate that we have the, here the, on the figure and the figure on the on the right, the electron heat diffusivity versus the inverse, uh, in, inverse collisionality. And they, uh, what they measure at the TCV tokamak is that they, when going from positive triangularity, this blue uh, figure here, in the blue curve here, and to negative triangularity, the uh, blue one, they get they got a, gener a general reduction of the electron heat diffusivity, which in turn implies a le less power out going outside of the plasma. 
Uh, this became more relevant when the DCD team re uh, repeated this experiment, not only with the uh, electron heating, but also with the uh, fast ion heating with the MBIs. And uh, they they and they were the first one, the first one obtaining the um, uh, the negative triangular the, the negative triangularity had a really high um, confinement values. And you can see that in the two panels in the middle, the beta, the normalized beta, the H98 factor, which is related to the how good is the confinement. And these values for the H98 and normalized beta are close to the ones that they obtain for the positive triangularity case. But in the case of the negative triangularity, the, uh, the situation is better because in general, you can see that in the D alpha emission, uh, there is no ELMS occurring. As Jesus already explained, the, the ELMS are not tolerable in the future for future fusion reactors. So this is having the, all the good things from the positive triangularity, which means high confinement, but no ELMS, which makes it uh, really, 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 really interesting for future reactors. However, this is still on the first rounds of the evolution. There is a, a, there is a lot of uh, studies, and indeed there is a need for the assessment of the albanite modes and the fast and the corresponding fast ion transport and losses as uh, there is already for the H mode. Now, um, this uh, already have been already started by the uh, DCD team as well. They the way they were able to excite TAEs, not only TAEs, but also all the all the fauna of the Alvenic, alvenic, uh, alvenic modes in uh, in their plasmas, and uh, this is experimental work. And they also did some uh, initial um, and also extensive um, numerical work. Actually, they use the part three D code. I think uh, Jacobo will give a, a really nice introduction to this code later. And in this uh, paper from twenty twenty one from Jessica Guy, also from the DCD uh, team. They obtained that the, there was an negligible impact uh, in the of the triangularity itself on the Alvenage mode growth rate. However, I would like to not to just remark a couple difference with the with the work I want to present because the, in the far 3D at least in the version code that she uses for this publication, the, they were using the linear uh, energetic particle driven uh, Alvenage mode and uh, two moments flu general fluid model for the fast ions, which is a little bit different from our, from our case. Now let me go back again to the TCV uh, to the TCV tokamak, and there has been some more recent experiments on the negative triangularity, and I, I would like to show you one of the these experiments that we carry out at the TCV. At the TCV, it is shown here in these two plan, uh, uh, figures on the right. Let me first start with the one on the bottom, where uh, the experiment started with a positive triangularity 0.13, and then flipped back to negative triangularity minus 0.13. You can see two main effects of the triangularity on the on the TA. First, a reduction on the amplitude. You can see here this associating with a really high amplitude and then just decays. And secondly, there is a reduction also on the on the frequency. However, you can see on the upper panel that this uh, story is not only related to the triangularity itself or not directly to the triangularity, but uh, due to the better confinement in this uh, negative triangularity phase, uh, the density raised uh, to, um, to twice its, va its value, which can ex explain the, the changes in the TA, um, in the TAE, but not only that, there's, there were changes in the Q profile, etc. Thus, the di direct comparison between the two is quite difficult. And for this reason, we need a nonlinear hybrid uh, simulations. Uh, we will use uh, nonlinear hybrid simulations with the code MEGA. To study the uh, study and assess the impact of the triangularity of the ion modes in the uh, in the other ion modes and the induced fast ion transport and losses. Now, with this motivation, I would like to go to the main uh, outline of the talk. Uh, I would like I will just go fast through the introduction to Mega because Jesus already gave a really nice one, and I will go fast to the uh, and I will show you the simulation setup that I used to compare the triangularity uh, in the triangularity using Mega. And with that, I will just give you some hints on the TAE's properties that we get in the in both cases and uh, some of the properties that we observe on the fast ions. First, on uh, uh, on the confined proper on the confined uh, population, which is the pi wave particle resonances that uh, as we saw already, they, they play a fundamental role on the uh, on explaining the phenomena related to the fast ions and also to the fast ion losses that we can obtain because of that uh, implemented uh, wall at the edges of the simulation. Now. 
the mega code uh, this is this is the fast we have two main uh, two main species the book plasma which is a basically a magnetohydrodynamic uh, using the magnetic hydrodynamic equations and we have the fast ion fast ions are the particle inset methods where um, we simulate the markers with the gyrokinetic equations using the delta f or full f we as, as uh, in the previous case we also use the delta f here these are coupled using the current density, as it appears in the uh, bulk, in the momentum equation, the bulk plasma. And just a couple of details, we use the for all the finite differences in syndical coordinates for the magnetohydrodynamic equations and explicit for all the rule equal equation for the time integration. Now, this um, really fast. Now we go for the simulation setup. How we're going to compare actually the how we're going to assess the differences between the um, the triangularities. So to do that, what we do, what we did is taking a positive triangularity uh, case from the TCV tokamak. You can see here this uh, PT. This the red curve here is just the last class flag surface on the of the of a given uh, shot uh, poles. Uh, that this this one actually, and with this all these um, plasma profiles, density, temperatures, and Q profile. And what we did is just while fixing all these uh, parameters here, we just took the last, last class flag surface flipped it and uh, build up another equilibrium and simulate both of them simultaneously. Um, now, uh, some of the simulation parameters, again, Delta F uh, method that we use in multi-end simulations with uh, less total numbers than Jesus, but still enough to reproduce the ends in our case. Now, for the fast ions, we use the anisotropic uh, ad hoc anisotropic as low within distribution, which is represented by this big uh, formula. But this big formula is, is nothing but the, the spatial part, which is this Gaussian term that is uh, having this shape, just for uh, is illustrating you. And there's um, the velocity term part, which is represented by this long formula, which is nothing but the slowing, typical slowing down formula with a birth velocity corresponding to the birth velocity the, that they have at the TCV team, which is corresponding to 25 kilo electron volts. And then the, they have the uh, we have the anisotropic part is coming as a Gaussian term in this capital lambda. This capital lambda is defined as uh, I show here mu over L times the uh, magnetic field on the axis. And to give you uh, an example of how this would like would uh, look like on the on a more um, visual uh, phase space pitch versus energy, you can see that for 0.55 uh, the this is the anisotropic slowing down that is something that we would expect experimentally now uh, to avoid the bias in our, exper our analysis we made a scan in different pitch angle injections which is we can more or less relate to this capital lambda zero and we also scan the different values of the row zero to avoid um, to um, uh, row zero which is just moving the center of this Gaussian term here uh, no, notice that the, uh, this scan revealed that there is no changes in the general trends, so uh, all the results remain more or less constantly independent of the initial fast ion distribution function. Now, with all of this, we need the simulations in mega, and the first thing that we uh, see is always the energy evolution, the toroidal mode energy evolution, you can see here. This is a multi end simulation, but only the n equal 3 is the one arising the most, so this is, uh, this will, uh, I will show you later, it will be our EA actually. Uh, the first feature we can see we can, uh, between the two uh, uh, triangularities is that the positive triangularity has a 40% more or less a uh, higher energy. Now, if we take the uh, if we make the Fourier transform of the uh, velocity of the radial velocity perturbation, and we uh, and we overplot it in, on top of the shear Albert-Weil continuum where we have uh, included the TAE gap. We observe that for the positive triangularity and negative triangularity, they both uh, match. They will. Uh, they are really uh, both of them really well inside the TAE gap and with a similar uh, structure and extended uh, radial radial extent. Um, just as a proxy, we, I decided to take the linear growth rate uh, for different uh, initial fast ion distribution functions. As I told you before, I made a scan to avoid uh, to uh, see the general general trends. And you can see that the, in general, the growth rate for negative triangularity is always lower than the positive triangularity, which confirms the fact that the 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 triangular the, tri the growth rates the different the difference in the growth rates is not coming because of the initial plasma distribution function, but because of something deeper in the plasma uh, in the plasma dynamics. For the rest, I will just show you some of the results, just for probability, uh, 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 related to this one. But notice that all the results are 
comparable in all the other uh, pairs of uh, initial facet distribution functions. Now, um, I will go show you some of properties of the fast of the fast ions. First, I would like to uh, to go quickly through the fast ion losses, and we use the two D wall that we set up on the on the edges of the simulation to catch up the fast ion the fast ion markers and and evaluate the fast ion losses. And what we see is that the uh, fast ion power flux that is on the lower panel here down here. Uh, the, the, the fast ion losses for the positive triangularity are three times larger, not only uh, the whole area, but also in peak flux compared to the negative triangularity case, which is represented here by the blue line. Also, it's just remarkable, and it's just a nice, a nice check, a nice check to that to do is that the, the, the bursts of fast ion losses are somehow correlated with the energy evolution. And you can see here that the positive triangularity has two main bumps correlated to the two main energy bumps, and the negative triangularity has only one main bump, which is corresponding to this one. Now, let's go to the origin of uh, to the confined population, which uh, let's do some uh, resonant energy exchange. Uh, this is the same as uh, Jesus that, uh, did for the M case, and it um, will give us some hints of what is the, which are the differences between the two triangularities. Again, the power ex Sorry? You have three minutes just yeah. to, for the moment. Yeah, thank you. Um, for the power exchange, um, again, we have, we show here the power exchange. Instead, I use the canonical momentum, but uh, it's equivalent in any other uh, of the... Uh, also, it would be equivalent also in the, uh, momentum, in the canonical momentum. And we see two main uh, regions where the energy exchange is uh, giving from energy from the fast ions to the wave, so the, where the fast ions are exciting the TA. And these are well aligned with the wave particle resonances with uh, two particular main uh, transit harmonics, P4 and P5. This is for only for the positive triangularity. But for the negative triangularity, this is uh, the situation is bar bar barely the same. They are aligned the, the uh, the energy exchange are aligned with the two main um, with two main uh, transit harmonics, but notice that the while for positive triangularity, the upper one, P equal four is the dominant uh, way to exchange the energy. This is not true for the negative triangularity case, which is uh, P four seems to be somehow damped in comparison to P equal five, which is a, a higher um, a bounce harmonic bounce slash uh, transit transit harmonic. This is for a maximum uh, energy exchange time point. Uh, if we go for the, if we integrate the uh, around these areas, we see that the this uh, is a, a generic. Uh, this is generic. The P equal four is somehow dumped all the time for the negative triangularity case. And overall, it's clear that the energy exchange is always larger for the positive triangularity case, which implies why that which is uh, explain why the positive triangularity has larger energies. And finally, I would like to conclude that uh, we we were able to use MEGA for uh, try to um, this uh, to study the difference between the triangularity uh, for uh, uh, to uh, try to isolate the uh, effects of the triangularity on the TAEs and the and the corresponding fast ion transport. And what we see is that the while the negative triangularity seems to be lower in energy for the and corresponding to the positive triangularity case, the most important fact is that the the fast ion losses are reduced up to uh, one third in the negative triangularity case, which make it, makes it more interesting for future uh, future fusion reactors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo. Very nice, very nice presentation on this. Very interesting. So question, I see Eddie. Hi, Pablo. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. I have a very general and maybe naive question. I don't know if I missed something, some important ingredient. You said that uh, this negative screen triangularity uh, configurations have no well, have less uh, alveolar eigen mode, has less fast ion losses. Also, I think there are studies of turbulence, trapped electron mode turbulence that is reduced also. Yes. However, the global co confinement or the global performance is similar to the positive triangularity. So I don't understand how can this be possible. 
So, I mean, in general, the, the, the studies, the, the, the main idea of the reduction of the electron heat dif uh, dif uh, diffusivity, let me go part, part by part, is this reduction is in the study by Alessandro Marinoni and all the people from TCE, which are really into the turbulence part. That reduction in the turbulence is because the, the stabilization of the T TEM, the trap electron mode, basically, mm -hmm. because of the change of the, um, the variation of the L. Sorry if I if I come with the word now with the uh, because of the changes of, of the of the resonances inside of, of for the trap electron mode. Now the uh, the idea is that the they reach the same values. Not, uh, notice that the negative triangularity still doesn't have a pedestal. That's the main point here. Negative in, uh, sorry, negative triangularity. No, sorry, the L mode doesn't have a pedestal, like, which is make what makes the positive triangularity to have these large um, uh, beta normalized and confinement factors. What makes what in general what makes uh, confinement good in the negative in the in the positive triangularity H mode is the pedestal and the uh, transfer, transport barrier. In negative triangularity, we uh, we want to get uh, uh, still rely on the uh, be still on the L mode, which doesn't have a pedestal. So one would expect to have. Uh, all the energy and particle transport uh, this is typical from the L mode, but thanks to these properties of the chain of the stabilization of the TEM and for uh, and uh, also the TAEs, we get a, re a, a reduction via other ways. So they are comparable, but it, but notice it's important that you are comparing something with a strong pedestal and a strong uh, edge barrier transport barrier with something that doesn't have an edge transport transport barrier. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Do you have a, is there anybody who wants to ask a question? If not, I want to ask a question. Sure. In page eight and nine, you you said delta, delta F gyrokinetic simulation, said, but uh, you're using a particle in cell. Uh, simulation. How how do you how do you do delta F simulation with uh, particle in cell? Not the yeah. not for the full F. No, I, I basically use the same method that Jesus has explained before. Uh, maybe it's just a uh, uh, a wrong wording here. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, I have another question. Sure. Small question. Uh, low balanced harmonic is observed in negative triangularity. This is very nice, interesting. Uh, is there, what's the physics mechanism you think? Is it simply come from the NHD stability nature or is there anything background? Mm, this is something I, I am still working on. It's a kind of, uh, sorry, it's not this one, this one. Um, the difference is, is not that clear just to my, to, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, I I am trying to, uh, I'm, we, are, we still don't understand why it's uh, getting the peak while for is suppressed compared mm -hmm. to the positive triangularity case. It's possible, I mean, it's possible, and this is just a hypothesis that it's coming because of the different um, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, frequencies in the phase space and because of different uh, the different orbits in the different triangularities, but yeah, I, okay. I, 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 I don't want to say anything unclear because I still, uh, we are still investigating it. Okay, thanks. Probably not simply from MHD, but resonance, etc. cetera, maybe contributed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But still, a very, very nice result. Huh? Very, very good result. Thank, Thank you, very you very much. much. It's time to move to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Pablo. <clears throat> next speaker is Mr. Audley. He's going to uh, present liquid metal MHD solvers for breeding blanket mouth physics application. Can you start your presentation, please? Uh, yes. Can you see it now? Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks. Great. And you can see my slides? Yes. Yes. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much. I'm going to be yeah, talking about um, scalable liquid metal MHD solvers for fusion breeder blanket multiphysics applications. Um, so 
I work at uh, UKAEA and um, our focus uh, in, in our group is to develop um, digital twinning for tokamaks um, ultimately. Um, so this is well known to be an exascale problem requiring high fidelity multi-scale simulations, which are going to cover um, multi-physics. And so that software needs to be validated. Um, the software needs to be scalable. Um, and as a result, the, the focus uh, of our group at the moment is on the Moose framework. And in particular, I'm working on the Proteus tool. Um, so frameworks like Moose are a good solution um, because they're open source um, and, and allow uh, us to develop custom tools with them. Um, the framework um, allows us to focus on the physics rather than um, on, on developing the uh, computational side itself. Um, and because of uh, systems like Moose's multi-app system, we can do uh, multi-physics coupling um, in a much simpler manner. Um, and it's also very scalable. So the general approach that our group's been taking is to break down the tokamak into its critical components, such as the breeder blankets, um, and some breeder blanket designs rely on the flow of the liquid metal. Uh, this is what I've been focused on. Due to the proximity of uh, the liquid metal um, to strong magnetic fields in the tokamak, um, the effects of liquid metal and HD become dominant. Um, so these are the uh, liquid metal MHD equations. So rather than taking the, the um, approach um, expected for plasmas, we instead consider resistive incompressible fluids. Um, and so we are basically taking the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, adding in the Lorentz force, and then solving either the full induction or the inductionless um, approach. So in the full induction case, um, we're solving for um, the um, varying magnetic field um, due to the flow, whereas in the inductionless case, which we can take when the magnetic Reynolds number is sufficiently low, um, we have a simpler set of equations, but both of these are um, very nonlinear, um, uh, uh, strongly coupled equations. The other key um, dimensionless parameter uh, to talk about is the Hartman number, um, and the key thing is that it's um, proportional to the magnetic field strength. So in fusion, um, liquid metals such as lead lithium and pure lithium are being considered as coolant and or breeding materials um, because their properties um, allow them to do so in fusion. Um, so the main considerations with this is that we need to be able to understand um, issues such as the pressure drop and flow stagnation. Um, and so in order to do this, we need to have um, validated liquid metal MHD codes. Um, so this paper in 2015 established five key validation cases. The first two, which are um, laminar steady MHD flow, um, are what I'm going to be concentrating on in this talk. Um, but future validation cases include um, moving to turbulence um, and adding in heat transfer as well. Um, so typically in a fusion breeder blanket, you'd expect a Hartman number getting up to around 10 to the 4, um, and achieving this high Hartman number um, in uh, numeral, numerical codes remains a significant challenge. Um, so this is one of the um, cases that we have an analytic solution for. Um, so this is Shercliffe flow. Um, this is a rec uh, flow in a rectangular duct where all of the walls are um, perfectly insulating. Um, you can see we have an inviscid core region um, where the flow is almost uniform. And then we have towards the edges, um, the, these layers. So the, the Hartman layers and side layers um, which scale inversely with um, increasing Hartman number. Um, we can also consider the Hunt flow case, um, where the uh, um, Hartman walls at the top and the bottom are conducting. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the case of perfectly conducting and perfectly insulating walls, um, but the solutions also um, generalize to arbitrary conductivity. Um, but the boundaries become much more complicated, and you need to take an approach such as modeling the wall currents. Um, so this is looking at um, a typical mesh for one of these simulations. So this is for a fairly low Hartman number, um, but we need to resolve the, um, the Hartman and side layers. And to do so um, becomes more tricky as we increase the Hartman number uh, because these layers get narrower. So we have two options. We can either sacrifice the uniformity of the mesh in order to maintain low resolution, um, but this can make it difficult for some codes to converge. Or alternatively, we can increase the overall um, element count in the mesh, um, which requires more resources, and therefore you really need good weak scaling for that to be an option. Um, 
in reality, we generally take a mixture of these approaches. Um, so this is showing what happens with circular flow as we increase the Hartman number. So you can see extremely narrow, and this is only for a Hartman number of 100 rather than 10 to the 4. Um, so we would expect even narrower um, layers. And then this is for hunt flow, where the uh, top and bottom walls are conducting. And you can see that we've got the velocity now concentrated in these jets along the side walls with a low velocity region in the core. Um, and as we increase the Hartman number, um, that disparity becomes even stronger with the velocity in the core dropping to zero. Um, so I've used a few solvers um, in this work. So I'm going to start by talking about OpenFoam, which is a, um, a free open source finite volume uh, piece of software for fluid dynamics. Um, there are two main open source um, solvers in uh, OpenFoam for MHD. Um, so MHD foam um, is a native open foam solver and solves the full induction um, formulation, whereas EPOT foam is a user-made solver that solves the induction approximation instead. Both of them are only transient solves, um, so there's no steady state option. Um, and compared to a lot of the other open foam CFD capability, they're relatively undeveloped, um, requiring additional features such as finite wall conductivity and potentially steady state. Um, those would be useful uh, extensions to it. So open foam is very useful, um, particularly for intermediate engineering applications, because we could um, do liquid methyl MHD studies without coupling to um, other aspects of physics. But if we wanted, we could um, uh, look to couple um, the open foam solvers into MOOSE to perform um, multi-physics applications or take a similar approach. Um, so now I'm going to talk about Proteus, which is um, a tool that I've been part of working on um, in our group, which is based on the MOOSE framework, and it's designed to extend MOOSE's native fluid dynamics capabilities for fusion applications. Um, so it's an open source um, bit of code, um, which gains all of the advantages of MOOSE. Um, and yeah, the target scope of it includes liquid metal MHD. Um, so I've been starting by implementing inductionless incompressible MHD, uh, taking the phi formulation like, like in EPOT foam. Um, but unlike open foam, this is a finite element code. Um, so it's using automatic differentiation to compute the Jacobians, and it's um, taking a fully coupled approach. So with Navier-Stokes and the electromagnetics all solved in one monolithic uh, matrix. I'm also using pressure stabilized petroglurkin and streamwise upwind petroglurkin stabilization in order to enable equal first order velocity and pressure. So I'm going to start by talking about um, some scaling results in open foam. So this is the, the case that I used. It's a, a simple Hartman number of 20 um, Shercliffe Crowe case um, where essentially the solution is two dimensional, but I've simulated it in um, 3D basically to get more cells and, and stress test it further. Um, for these scaling tests, I use the CSD3 supercomputer in the UK. Um, and um, yeah, I looked at three different cases for strong scaling, um, in each case, increasing the number of cells. Um, and I use mesh grading in the lower resolution cases um, to resolve the boundary layers. For the weak scaling, I um, kept a constant 10,000 cells per core and then increased the number of cells in the cores. Um, and I measured, in each case, the time per time step um, and averaged that uh, to, get, to get a value. Um, but the uh, weak scaling case, I had to reduce the time step um, as resolution increased um, according to the CFL condition. So uh, here you can see the strong scaling results. Um, so uh, the first two plots show fairly typical um, uh, strong scaling profiles, where you can see that um, value of n0.8, um, where n is uh, the number of cells per core, um, as so n0.8 is the value at which um, the efficiency drops below 80%. Um, we see that that increases um, as the resolution increases. Um, but if we look at the uh, 10 million cell case, um, we actually get initially super linear scaling, which is very nice to see. Um, and this, this is because we're sat in this uh, point where we're, we're um, at more cells per core than N0.8. If we now move on to look at weak scaling, um, you can see that this doesn't follow the ideal profile, but it's fairly reasonable weak scaling. 
And the reason why it deviates from this is that the number of iterations per field per time step is increasing as resolution increases. And this is because we're dealing with a sparse matrix problem. Um, potentially, this could be improved by um, more carefully choosing the preconditioner case, but I didn't have a chance to do this. Um, so that's something to look into. If we then look at the second plot, um, this shows how the error uh, decreases as we increase the number of cores, um, which is um, showing the increase in resolution. Um, so you can see that um, EPOT foam actually struggles when it's under-resolved, so it's particularly sensitive to being able to resolve those boundary layers. Um, you can also see that the pressure drop error seems to be high for EPOT foam, and I'm not sure why um, this uh, is such a difference. Um, but you can also see that both of the solvers failed in this case above 12 million cells. I think this is simply due to them requiring a smaller time step than I adjusted for. Um, but this is somewhere where um, a feature such as adaptive time stepping might well help uh, with solving this, but that's not currently an option in these solvers. So I'm now going to move on to talk about some validation results. Um, so here you can see um, Shercliff flow and hump flow. Um, which is the case I talked about earlier. Um, this is shown for EPOT foam, MHD foam, uh, which is only in the Shercliffe flow case, and, and Proteus as well. Um, you can see that EPOT foam and MHD foam both mostly do a good job of um, matching the analytic solution. Um, however, you can see in the Hump flow case, EPOT foam uh, slightly deviates from the solution um, in the, uh, the velocity profile in the y direction. Um, which you can see by the, the right-hand blue uh, plot. Um, however, um, both EPOT foam and MHD foam um, overall, um, in terms of the RMS error in um, velocity, were very accurate, um, around 2 to 3%, um, whereas Proteus um, was seen to miscalculate the magnitude of the velocity. So the profile um, for both circular flow and hump flow is about right, but the magnitude is off. Um, so this is something that I'm continuing to investigate. Uh, I also identified another problem in Proteus, which was that I couldn't increase the mesh grading um, as high as in um, uh, open foam. Um, and this is a limitation that I'm currently trying to deal with. But um, yeah, it doesn't currently converge um, with higher mesh grading, which unfortunately, unfortunately limits um, how high I can increase the Hartman number. Um, you have two, so, two more minutes. Sorry? You have two more minutes, please. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, yes, so I'm now going to look at what happens when we increase the Hartman number. Um, so this is just looking at um, EPOT foam now. The main thing here is that I had to increase the resolution to resolve the boundary layers. Um, and I also found that I had to decrease the time step, which I think is due to uh, needing to resolve the magnetic time, damping time, which you can see here. Um, and yeah, this um, seems to resolve uh, this solution nicely. If we then increase to a Hartman number of 1,000, again, we have a similar situation. I did find that I needed to increase the velocity in order to speed up the computation um, while still maintaining uh, laminar flow. Um, but yeah, it took a few hours um, on one node um, on the, the cluster I was using. Um, and the main issue I found here was that in terms of the hunt flow, while these profiles do seem to match well, when I calculated the RMS error in the velocity profile, um, the uh, error was quite high. And I think this seems to be due to uh, where the velocity is crossing zero. Um, so in a few regions, that's uh, a problem. And so I need to investigate this further. Um, this is now looking at a slightly more complex case where we have um, the magnetic field varying along um, the flow axis. Um, so this is based on one of the um, um, uh, validation cases, um, but unfortunately doesn't match quite because um, these solvers currently um, only work with perfectly insulating or conducting walls rather than having arbitrary wall conductivity. Um, to enable this, um, that the uh, non-uniform magnetic fields. I had to make some modifications to EPOT foam, um, which you can find here. But you can see that jets form um, in the flow um, where the magnetic field gradient is steepest. Uh, so to conclude, um, the results from open foam are quite promising. Um, there are some limitations, um, such as uh, needing some further work to implement more general boundary conditions and to couple into other solvers. 
Um, and you can see that the, the pressure drop um, and velocity um, are produced um, quite accurately, although I do need to investigate what's going on um, at the high Hartman number. Um, in terms of Proteus, unfortunately, the um, flow profile magnitude is not quite right. Um, and the convergence is limited when using non-uniform meshes, which prevents going to higher Hartman numbers. Um, the second problem, uh, identifying the best preconditioners may well help with this, um, but this is a very early start. I'm quite new to using Moose, and this is only in its um, early stages in terms of development. So I'll be continuing to investigate uh, these problems and develop the implementation further. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd love any questions or suggestions, and please feel free to contact me. Um, but yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. It was a good presentation. Good work. Thank you. So, anybody, is there any question from the audience? Oh, 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 oh. Ah. There's a question in chat. Oriol Fernandez, he says, Hi, Bert. Thanks for the presentation. It was very, really interesting. I have one question. Which advantages has Moose over other finite element method codes for electromagnetics, like for example, MFEM? -E um, yeah. yeah, so um, one of the, the great things about Moose is that while it itself has its own capabilities for, for solving certain physics. Um, it also allows you to relatively easily couple in external codes. Um, so we also have um, some work going on uh, to couple MFM into uh, Moose, which is being used for uh, electromagnetism. Um, uh, and similar works going on um, with other aspects of physics. So the, the core thing with Moose is that it's a really nice framework that allows us to simply implement some aspects of physics, whereas if it's um, not sufficient for um, our, our needs in other aspects, we can we can um, use separate tools. So at the moment, yeah, this is just uh, Proteus is just using the um, in-house um, capabilities kind of within um, Moose, um, but potentially a way to go um, in the future would be to use um, something like MFEM to do the uh, electromagnetism side um, of this. Because um, so far I've just been focused on the kind of the fluids component rather than um, the EM part. Um, but yeah, it's helpful being able to take advantage of different codes um, in order to get the best solution. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Other questions? I have a quick question. Uh, you, you used seven, 76 cores uh, for Hartman number 1000 using mm -hmm. open for uh, to, be, to make it more realistic, how do you say, more realistic number. It's more, uh, you need more resolution, probably you need more uh, number of cores, but how, how do you think, is it possible for example, if you want to use Hartman number uh, 5,000, for example, simply you multiply five times of number of CPUs or? Um, yes, yeah, so, so I, would, I would expect it's probably possible. Um, so far, I essentially just ran out of time uh, to go up to a higher Hartman number. Um, so because it, if I were to increase um, the Hartman number further, um, that would generally require um, both higher higher resolution um, and therefore would could keep it on keep it on the same resources and it would take uh, longer. But for these simulations, I was um, running with more um, cells per core than the N zero point eight value, so I would, I would expect to get um, fairly reasonable scaling. Um, okay. so probably should be okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It's time to have a break. So let's meet. Let's meet again at ten past three. Ten past three.
So thank you very much, all the speakers. It was a nice presentation. Uh, see you in 20 minutes. Hello, welcome back to the second session of the MH second session of the MHD session. Uh, this is my microphone. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's move to the second uh, next uh, next talk given by <clears throat> Dr. Jacob Jacobo Valer Valera. Uh, Hello, good afternoon. Yeah. Would you start? Yes, please. Sure. Let's go. Okay. Okay, first of all, thank you for the chance to give this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about optimization of plasma heating efficiency in fusion system through suppression of energetic particles instabilities and this is a global collaboration between uh, different institutions. Uh, so here I'm writing my main collaborators, although there are a lot of other collaborators in different institutions, so I won't go through all of them. But, well, the main index of the talk <clears throat> will be a first uh, an introduction about the code and about the problem I try to uh, solve. And also some invest uh, the discussion about several actuators that can modify the alberic activity in nuclear fission device, for example, neutral beam current drive, thermal plasma control, neutral beam injector operational regime, electrocyclotron current drive, electrocyclotron heating, and also saturation, analysis of the saturation phase and transition to hard MSD regimes, and finally a summary. Well, uh, with respect of the, of the problem, basically what we are working here is with albenic activity and what is an, an albenic mode, that is the main question. So as you know, shared albenic waves are transverse electromagnetic waves that propagate along the magnetic field lines. And we can define the special relation of the shared albenic waves using the equation you can you can see here. We basically it correlates relates the wave frequency, uh, wave vector, and the alben velocity. And also, if we include the effect of the periodicity in fusion devices, well, we can write the wave vector using uh, the, the the value of the uh, safety factor and the mode number of the wave. Well, something we know about the waves that satisfy the dispersion relation are part of the Alben continuum. And we also know that uh, periodic variation of the Alben velocity creates gaps in this Alben continuum. And here we have the problem because we know that the, the Alben gap EGMOS can be destabilizing these gaps because there is not an energy transfer or weak energy transfer towards the continuum. And that means that this CADMOS can show exponentially growth and get very unstable and make problems in the in the discharge so well now coming back to the uh, to the device we want to analyze and focus in the problem uh, why the the avena stability stability is an important issue well because as you know in a fusion uh, reactor we will have alpha particles that can generate avena again but also we have heatings metals that will, will induce also energetic particles for example in this case we are seeing the torus so we are seeing how the MBI injector is generating energetic particles and also uh, ACRH, can, uh, ACRH can also uh, generate uh, energetic particles. The consequences uh, you will observe in the discharge this kind of activity at high frequency range that will be generated by these energetic particles and are, are albenic activity. So what we use is a code to analyze which kind of albenic activity we observe in the, in the device. So what is the main problem? The main problem is if we have albemos that are unstable, we will have an inefficient plasma heating. And that happens because if you have uh, uh, albenic modes, you will have an increase of the transport of energetic particles and they will leave the system before they thermalize. So it means that you are wasting money because you are not heating the, the device and also you can have problems uh, uh, in, the, in the walls of the reactor. And of course, you cannot create a fusion reactor if you don't have an efficient heating. Well, so uh, what is the um, why we must uh, avoid this albenic mode? Well, as, I, as I told you, uh, these energetic particles can leave instabilities that will enhance the transport. And also, uh, we know that this is a path problem 
because uh, this uh, energetic particles or alphas will be lost before thermalization and the concept will be damage of the facing uh, uh, elements of the, of, the, of the reactor in an efficient plasma heating, increase of the operational scenario requirements and also a reduce or hamper of the economic viability of the reactor. So well, what do we do to uh, analyze this issue? Well, we use a false 3D code. And false 3D code is a general fluid code Basically, we are coupling a thermal plasma with the perturbation with energetic particles. And for the thermal plasma, we are using uh, a, a, the reduced MHD. And for the energetic perturbation, what we do is to couple these uh, reduced MHD equations with momentum of the generic equation to introduce through the Landau closure the kinetic, the, the kinetic truncation, uh, the, 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 the truncation of the zero kinetic energy we need to reduce the number of momentum we include in the model. So basically, using this approximation, we can analyze pressure and current gradient driven modes coupled with the wave particle resonance effect, reproducing the land out of growth and damping. The main features of R3D in the linear and nonlinear version of the code is we are solving a 3D series system. So we are using beam equilibria as input. We can introduce toroidal and helical couplings. We can also introduce experimental profiles as input. We can work with several species at the same time, up to three species at the same time. For example, we can have alphas, MBI energetic particles, also ACH particles at the same time in the same simulation. We can also introduce phenyl armor radius for energetic particles and thermal plasma and also electron ion lateral damping effects. We can also use an Eigen solver. That means that we can analyze not only the dominant modes, but also we can analyze the subdominant modes. And we can uh, apply this model for passing particles and also for traveling particles. Well, wh why we use a zero fluid core and we don't use a kinetic or a hybrid code? Well, the reason is because the simulation times is much shorter. I mean, we can do serial simulations in minutes. And that allows us to perform parametric studies and also make a fast interpretation of the experimental data. Well, uh, thanks to that, we can do optimization studies. For example, we can analyze what is the effect of the MBI operational regime with respect to the power of the MBI that is related with the beta of the energetic particles, the voltage, because it's related with the energy of the energetic particles and also the deposition region. We can also analyze the effect of the magnetic field topology, for example, uh, introducing actuators as the MBI current drive or the electron cyclotron current drive. We can also analyze effects of multiple energetic particle populations. That's, uh, that's what, this is what we call multiple energetic uh, damping effects and also analyze the effect of uh, the thermal plasma density and temperature. So this <clears throat> gives us the possibility to make an experiment interpretation. For example, we can characterize the albanic activity, for example, identifying the albanic family, the dominant modes they can function structure, identify stability trends, analyze dominant and subdominant modes, and also if we use a nonlinear version of the code, we can analyze the saturation phase of these modes and analyze the bursting, chirping, sonar flows, sonar currents between other the energetic particle transport between other issues related with albumic activity. Uh, an important question that people used to, uh, to make me is uh, why, uh, what, what does, why, why would you, what is the relation between zero fluids and zero kinetic? How we can combine them? I mean, they are they opposed between them? Well, no, it's not necessary. We, in fact, we think that both approaches are, co are complementary. And the question is why? Well, because uh, when we perform zero fluid simulations, because the code is quite fast, we can do a fast resonance identification and we can even uh, calibrate the input data. So that will help zero, fluid, uh, zero kinetic codes to reduce the parametric range they must use because it takes much longer time to perform a simulation and also to improve the input data. And at the same way, uh, the zero kinetic uh, simulation will provide us an improved value for the Landau clues where we need to calibrate our, our model. Sorry. Okay, so oh, yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to show you several examples of uh, 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 research projects that we are doing with uh, with FAR 3D. So, uh, uh, for example, for the case of the C3 plasma, a few years ago, we make a collaboration with them to try to help them to identify which kind of albenic activity they observe in their discharge. And as you can see, they have plenty of albenic activity here, as you can see in the CO2 interferometer and also in the magnetics. So what we did was to run FAR 3D at different times along the discharge to try to give some kind of info about which kind of albenic activity you see here. And in fact, what we did was not only calculate what we observe 
from the code also compare directly with experimental data because for us having a good uh, 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 having a reasonable results means that we have to obtain uh, albino gamos in the same frequency range they observe in the in the experiment but also the eigen function structure should be dissimilar to the one they observe in the in the in the experiment and also the dominant modes we have we need to find should be the same that the ones they find in the experiment so if we can do that we can say that we achieve a good uh, reproduction of the resonance that happens in the in the experiment for example another another example is uh, the analysis we did for the case of lhd because we know that in lhd when you have the when you have a unbalanced current drive uh, sorry unbalanced neutral beam injection and you have a, a generation of current drive due to the mbi we, we know that the albinic activity is very different in this case as you can see during the, the simulation you have phase different two different phases of current drive and you can see that in the counter cd phase uh, you, uh, counter means that the toroidal current goes in opposite direction than the magnetic field you have a valvenic activity but in the phase with cos cd you don't have valvenic activity so what we did was to do a theoretical analysis trying to in introduce the effect of the current drive in the in the structure of the iota and as you can see here uh, there is a strong deformation of the iota profile linked to the effect of the co uh, neutral beam current drive for example in this case you can see that when you increase the current drive uh, uh, to 20 kiloamps per tesla you can see how for example the uh, rational surface uh, one two goes non-resonance and this will lead to an important stabilizing effect in the pressure gradient driven modes in the core of the plasma and also, if we compare configurations without with balanced current and with configuration with the strong co neutral beam current drive current, that means that you will have a very large difference in the in the in, in the continuums. In fact, uh, this con this different configuration will have completely different stability threshold with respect to the albenica. Also, uh, we can uh, you can also see that. Uh, comparing the, the, the analysis with it theoretically with the experiment, you will also see that there is reasonable uh, uh, similarity between simulations and, and, and the experiment. Well, another, uh, uh, another uh, example is a recent uh, experiments we did also in LSD plasma, where we use, where we did a, a control of the neutral beam current drive uh, to uh, avoid the destabilization of being again more. And we can find is that. At some point, uh, when you uh, you are above a given threshold of the uh, of the current drive, in the counter phase, you can see that we can stabilize this albenic activity. Okay, so you can see that uh, the the neutral beam current drive is a good actuator to stabilize MHD activity. Uh, another thing we did was to use far 3D to reproduce or to reproduce this sweeping and stabilization of the albenic activity, and the first thing you observe is when you have configurations with, with uh, quite a low uh, iota minimum, you will have quite a slender albany gaps. Also, when you have the iota minima quite high, you will see that this is the pink one. Uh, you, you will see that you will have wider uh, uh, albany uh, continuum gaps, and also they are displaced as, as higher, um, higher frequencies. Uh, thanks to the FRTD simulation, we are able to reproduce the sweeping of the albenic uh, uh, mode frequency, and also we can identify why this mode gets unstable when you have a large enough countercurrent drive because the albenic gaps get so narrow that eventually the continuum damping and uh, energetic particle failure uh, damping effects gets strong enough to stabilize this mode, as you can see at some point the albenic activity vanish. And also, thanks to the simulations, we could also identify the albenic, uh, the structure of the albenic modes, that evolves from a global albenic again modes to a toroidal albenic again modes as the, the discharge evolves. Uh, another example is uh, a, a discharge where we try to control the current drive and also the density uh, of, the, of, the, of the plasma to achieve a, a discharge with a stable albenic uh, with a stable MSD activity. At the beginning of the discharge, you you can see that we have some activity in low frequency. That means that we have unstable pressure gradient driven mode. But at some points, 
this most stabilized and we, we began to have uh, albenic activity at higher frequency range, but at some point, both of them are stabilized. We achieved that thanks the, to the uh, neutral beam current drive, a co-neutral beam current drive in this phase, in the, in, in the co-neutral uh, beam phase, will lead to an increase of the iota profile, leading to the uh, one-two rational surface to be non-resonance, and that means that main part of the uh, the the pressure gradient even more you observe here are, are stabilized thanks to that. And also, due to the decrease of the density, uh, you observe here at the end of the, uh, of the discharge, but uh, they uh, are com compensated by an increase of the temperatures to keep the same thermal beta of the plasma, we can achieve both the stabilization of pressure gradient driven modes and also uh, albane again modes. Uh, also, another uh, Analysis we did for this uh, for this uh, this charge was to identify uh, the optimal operational regime of the MBI to minimize the arbenic activity. And in this case, what I show you is the effect of displacing outwards, make going from one axis to axis the MBI injection. And what we identify is when you have an outward an, an, an of axis injection, the growth rate of the Albania game, so you can see it's much lower compared with one axis. And that happens because if you analyze what happens with the structure of the, of the, of the gaps, you will see how uh, at uh, 5.8 seconds, you have a quite wide TA gap, that is the blue line in the magnetic, uh, close to the, between the inner and middle plasma region. And this will is that as soon as you have a gradient of the energetic particle density profile, you will destabilize Albanic modes here. Uh, and this is the reason why when you move outwards this, um, this um, uh, the, the injection of the MBI, the stability of, of the plasma inputs. Well, now I'm going to talk, uh, show you another actuators we applied to improve the stability of, of, uh, of the albenic modes. For example, the, the generation of electrocyclotron current drive in LHD plasmas and also in electron J plasma was confirmed. And what we did was to compare uh, this charge without ECCD with, with the charge with a strong counter ECCD. As you can see in the experiment, uh, the discharge without ECCD has plenty of uh, albenic activity from TAEs to VGAEs to energetic particle modes. Oh, but as soon as you introduce the counter ECCD, main part of this most stabilized and only some activity at low, lower frequency range remains. Well, using FAR3D, we could uh, identify the different modes that appears in the discharge in the in the in the case without ECC and in the case with with counter ECCD, and using a stellar gap, we can under, we could also understand why the albenic modes are stabilized, and that happens because in the counter ECC phase, the the, the continuum gaps as much as are much more slender compared with the case without ECCD or with co ECCD, because as you can see here the gaps are much more wider and it's easier to destabilize salvenic activity, okay? And that explains why we can, thanks to this actuator, improve the salvenic activity of the system. Same discussion, uh, we can apply for the case of the electron cyclotron heating, for the case of heliotron J plasmas, as you can observe, experimentally, they observe that when they increase the power injection of the ECH, at some point, they can partially stabilize the uh, the the albenic activity you observe in the discharge that is, that is also reproduced by FAR3D, that is basically a one two energetic particle mode around 88 kilohertz, and also a global albenic mode to four at 141 kilohertz. And what we did with FAR3D was also to try to reproduce the effect in the albenic activity associated with the increase of the electron temperature by the ECH. And something that must be, must be said in this case is Increasing the uh, electron uh, temperature leads to the, the modification of a lot of parameters at the same time. Uh, you are modifying at the same time the, th um, um, the electron alarm damping, you are con ch changing the continuum damping, you are changing the energetic particle beta, you are changing several variables at the, at the same time. So ECH is a particularly complicated actuator. It's not as straightforward, for example, as, as the electron cyclotron current drive because it just modified the, the IOTA profile. In the case of DCH, it's, it's, it's useful in some cases, but it's very complicated to use in an efficient way. Uh, 
uh, thanks to introducing all these different factors that change at the same time, we were able to reproduce the observations. And we observe in the simulations how the albanic activity remains uh, active when you are in a, with the temperature of the thermal plasma around 0 0.5 kilo electron volts, but when you increase the temperature due to the ECH injection, these modes are fastly stabilized. And this stabilization is done by the improvement of the damping effects by electron alarm damping and uh, phenyl alarm radius energy of the particle sessions. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Um, the, another part of the analysis was dedicated to the effect of the uh, uh, energetic particle stabilization uh, 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 controlling the density and temperature of the plasma. And what we did was to use FAR 3D to analyze the operational scenario where uh, 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 these energetic pore modes are destabilized in the periphery of LST. And what we did was to make a parametric analysis. Uh, uh, analyzing the, the, the interchange mode and also uh, energetic particle mode stability for different values of the plasma density and plasma temperature. And what we identified is the uh, stability threshold line that separates the operation region with, uh, with energetic particle modes that are called, this particular energetic pore modes are called ERC in, in LSD that are called the energetic uh, ion driving resistive interchange modes. And, with respect to the pure uh, interchange stability. And when we compare the result with the experimental data that is ident identified by these uh, stars, is, there is a reasonable agreement between this threshold stability line between different types of instabilities. Uh, with respect to nonlinear simulations, what we did was to perform nonlinear simulations to analyze the saturation phase of this energetic particle mode. And what we did was to compare the experimental observation, as you can see, with the simulations. In the experiment, what we observe is at some point, the ERC saturates and they can generate boosting activity that is characterized by the inward displacement of the perturbations and also a complex eigenfunction structure. What we did was uh, nonlinear simulations to try to exactly reproduce what is going on in the experiment. And we observed is we could also reproduce this bursting activity. And we think that that happens because there is an overlapping between the 1-1 one, one year C with uh, energetic particle modes induced by the 3-4 and 2-3 modes. And this, the overlapping of these three uh, inter instabilities cause the inward propagation and also a big loss of uh, energetic particles. And in this case, what is going on is what we call a transition to the hard energy regime. That means that you have different resonance overlapping along the minor radius, and this will lead to uh, global relaxations of the plasma. Similar study we did to other kind of uh, instability, uh, called uh, other kind of, another kind of event called uh, uh, MHD burst. And in this case, as they observe in the experiment, what will happen is at some point, you begin to see albanic activity in the frequency range between 40 to 80 kilohertz, and you see a, a boosting activity in, in magnetics. So what we did was to perform linear simulations to try to identify how this MSD boost is triggered. And what we obtained, this is experimental data. We could reproduce the, the experiment. We identify a, 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 a albanic activity in frequency range. And what we observe is uh, the MSD boost is generated when you have several uh, uh, TAEs uh, uh, destabilized at the same time, particularly in equal one to n equal three TAEs, that they locally overlap. And this will lead to a partial draw, uh, decrease of the energetic particle population that is observed in, in the evolution of the energetic particle density profile. Eventually, at some point, you begin to see a last uh, outward flux of the, of the particles. Well, up to here, the presentation. So the, the summary is uh, we are we analyze several actuators to improve the albanic activity in nuclear fusion devices. We explore the effect of the neutral beam current drive and uh, ECCD uh, to modify the iota profile and the, uh, the continuum gaps to improve, to improve the albanic stability. <coughs> and in particular, we found that if you have a slender continuum gaps, you will have an improved albanic st stability because you will have a higher energetic particle beta threshold. Uh, uh, with respect to the thermal ion density, you also know, you, we also observe that when you increase the thermal ion density, you also modify the continuum gap and you will have slender gaps that will also improve the albinic activity. This is the reason why in LSD, 
discharge event modes are stable above a given value of the uh, plasma density. We also identified how ECH can uh, stabilize the ionic activity due to an increase of the thermal ion FLR effects and also uh, uh, electron ion and down damping and the continuum damping as the electron temperature increase as the ECH power increase. And another important result is resonance overlapping during the saturation phase of albenic modes and energetic particle modes can lead to global relaxation and large losses of the energetic particle population. This is the reason why hard MSD limit should be avoided to have an efficient plasma heating. So up to here the presentation, uh, do you have any question? Thank you very much. It's a nice, nice presentation, nice work. It's, Thank uh, you. It's nice. uh, do you have any question uh, from Pab Pablo? Would you unmute the microphone and say? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for, for the really nice, interesting talk. And I would like Thank to you. go back basically to the beginning about to, uh, Landau closure. Basically, you say that you combine uh, uh, where you have like a sort of uh, a loop between the gy gyro fluid and gyro kinetic. They use the gyro fluid mm -hmm. to calibrate the gyro kinetic and then you use it to improve the gyro fluid. Um, yes, this is to... one of the things we do. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So basically, in your in your gyro fluid, you use the Landau closure, taking the the poles from the gyro kinetic. But what uh, we take from gyro kinetic is the answer function that gives us the Landau closure. Okay, in that in that way, the can the gyro fluid, um, so to say, model the um, the resonances uh, like uh, in the like localized resonances in the phase space, like a kinetic model can do, or is something that um, is not they're really the gyro fluid doing sorry i mean um... but exactly what do you mean in the phase space you mean that uh, if we modify the energy of the particle we the target energy of the particle we analyze you mean that no in the sense that um most of i mean uh, most of the the, the the ta interaction with the fast time is always is mostly via the uh, resonance uh, but these resonances mm -hmm. are uh, so to say localized in the phase space in the momentum space Yes. Is the uh, effects included in the gyro fluid or it's uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's approximately included? It's included. included. Yes, so, it's included. Let me let me show you the equations. So basically what we do uh, mm -hmm. is to introduce the effect of the resonance through operators. In particular, you have two operators, that is the average drift velocity and mm -hmm. also the average drift frequency that introduce the effect of the resonance. And the only limitation we have is yeah. uh, we can only use uh, Maxwellians to, for the distribution function of the energetic particles, but to compensate that, what we do is parametric analysis, fitting okay. the Maxwellian to, to, the, to the slowing down distribution. That means that what we are doing is basically uh, breaking in pieces the, the slowing down to analyze the test stabilizing yeah, effect of different population of energetic particles. Okay, thank you. And now a second question, more related to the ECRH mitigation, uh, ECC, sorry, EC, ECCD mitigation. Yes. Can you, uh, there, no, the, previous one. ECCD. E, no, the current drive, yes. Here you, you talk about the LHD plasma and here I can see some, some results that are, I mean, I really already know, but I don't know mm -hmm. if you're aware of the work done by the um, Dr. Sergei Sharapov in uh, ASDEX in uh, TCV, where he was also applying the country CCD to achieve these very same results in Tokamaks. Mm -hmm. But not, not only that, they, uh, they, are, they reach to even an analytical expression related to the gradient, the, the local gradient, pressure gradient, and the shear. And they could match really well with experiments. Have you? Do you know about that? And if so, yes, how, yes. In fact, uh, Sergey. To... Yes, in fact, Sergey and me, we are doing team here in LSD. He was. Okay. We were a few weeks ago together in LSD performing experiments, and we are working together. In fact, he's now work using LSD to. Uh, sorry, using far 3D to analyze some LSD discharge with the, where you have a stabilization due to the effect of VCCD particularly for the case of helical albing agamons. So, yes. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, perfect, sorry. Yeah, We're working uh, together. Yeah, but, uh, sorry. Th thank you very much, then. You are welcome. Really nice again. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have any questions? We have one more minute. 
Jesus. Yeah, yeah. could you? Yes, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. Okay, uh, thanks for the talk, uh, Jacobo. Um, uh, unfortunately, I had to miss uh, the beginning and I would like to ask a very general uh, question, um, yes. which is more or less connected to a uh, part of Pablo, but uh, basically you are showing here results in, in accelerator configurations. Yes. Um, so I would like to know if uh, you have considered in the future or if you have already done some work for Tokamas and maybe with different geometries, like in positive or or negative uh, triangularities. I don't know if that can be something interesting to to, to explore. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, we are doing collaboration with these 3D people, Jet people, East, uh, JT60 uh, Super Upgrade. Uh, in, in fact, I have collaboration with people from Sevilla that are applying the code for Asdex. So yes, I mean we are applying applying the code also for Tokamas. Yes. If you have any uh, suggestion, is uh, very welcome. <laughs> no, no, I just I was just wondering whether um, maybe it, it could be I don't know interesting since now the topic of negative triangularity is is becoming very popular. I don't know mm -hmm. if maybe that can be something like the work you have applied to examine how the the consequences of your work in such geometries. But I don't know if that can be something. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. In fact, there is already a paper, but it's not written for me, it's written for one of my colleagues of the FAR 3D project, that is Jessica Gay from Orenel Laboratory, that we, she applied FAR 3D to analyze negative triangularity operation in this 3D. Uh, ah, there are, yes, this yes, a paper yes, 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 yes. one year ago. On the top. It's true, it's true, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, ben, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you very much. So let's move to the next speaker. Thank you thank very you. much. Uh, thank you. Next speaker is uh, Johannes, Mr. Johannes Hoffman. Would you unmute the microphone and start your presentation, please? Are you there? Uh, is it working? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Not clearly. Not clear. Sound, uh, but, uh, is it better now? Can you can you share your screen by the way? Yeah, sure. Um, are you seeing my screen? Yeah, but it's not full screen. It's not full uh, no, screen. I will, I will do it now. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. My name is... <laughs> thank you. My name is uh, Janus Hopman. Um, I'm from the CTTC of the Technical University of Catalonia. And I will be presenting some work that we've been doing in the lab uh, called a highly portable heterogeneous implementation of symmetry preserving methods for magnetohydrodynamics. Uh, this talk consists of three sections. First, I will talk about the symmetry preserving method that we use for magnetohydrodynamics. Then I will introduce our HPC squared framework. Uh, and finally, I will talk about exploiting symmetries in the geometry of the domain uh, to speed up the calculations. So first, a uh, brief introduction for uh, MHD. Uh, if we have a fusion reactor, as an example, uh, you'll know that at some parts you will have liquid metals moving through a magnetic field. Um, and in a simplified uh, diagram, it's folded like this with the transverse magnetic field indicated by B, um, which in turn will um, create a transverse current in the duct, uh, which looks like this. And this transverse current will uh, subsequently create uh, an opposing uh, force through the Lorentz force. Uh, slowing down the flow, especially in the center of the duct, um, like this, and this in turn will create a characteristic M-shaped uh, flow because at the sides, um, the Lorentz force is less strong. Um, so how do we implement this in our solver? Uh, we follow the method of me and colleagues, uh, which makes use of a collocated uh, scheme depicted on the right with staggered current densities J, uh, which, is, uh, which conserves the current density. 
And the basics of this scheme are first to update the velocity using the projection method. And then you solve a second Poisson equation for the electric potential, which is given by this formula. Uh, then we update the current density, uh, which is then divergence free. Um, subsequently, finally, we have to interpolate this uh, current density to the cell centers to calculate the Lorentz force. Uh, and we adapted this uh, method to fit in our symmetry preserving method, which follows the method of trias uh, and colleagues. And it aims to conserve physical properties by mimicking continuous operators in the discrete operators. Uh, and some consequences are that for the uh, gradients at the faces, it uses projected distances, uh, so not the direct distance. Uh, for the convective term, it uses midpoint interpolation, and for phase-to-cell interpolations, it uses phase wall volume weighted interpolations. And the consequences for uh, this MHD scheme is that we uh, try to avoid iterative corrective uh, correction schemes introduced by me. Uh, and in the end, we aim to conserve the total momentum from the Lorentz force uh, given by this, uh, this formula. So how did we test this? Uh, we uh, came up with a new benchmark case um, following from an existing one, the 2D Taylor Green Vortex, but now with the liquid uh, metal in a transverse magnetic field. So this case consists of a normal hydrodynamic Taylor Green Vortex, which is a case with uh, vortices in a periodic uh, domain. Uh, then what we do is we uh, add a transverse magnetic field, which uh, then in turn, uh, the flow will attempt to create uh, this transverse um, or this uh, perpendicular current denoted with the black arrows. But then what we do is on top of that, we uh, superimpose um, electric potential field, which exactly cancels this uh, electric current. So the sum of the fields on the right should uh, not create any current and therefore not any Lorentz force. So even though there is a transverse magnetic field, we do not want to see any influence of the Lorentz force. Uh, but this can be numerically challenging, especially if you move to a distorted grid. Uh, and next to that, we also did a, a MHD duct flow to see if we could uh, generate this uh, end profile that I discussed in the beginning. So uh, we looked at the energy budgets that were created in the stellar green vortex, and especially um, to the uh, one uh, in the dotted line, the Lorentz force budget term. Now, first we did this on a Cartesian grid, and uh, the bars are denoted with blue and orange, but they're invisible because the errors are uh, insignificantly small, um, as they should be. But then when we move to distorted grids, we can see that uh, the knee method, uh, especially for this Lorentz force term, has a very large error. So it's creating a lot of current and in turn a lot of uh, Lorentz force. And the symmetry preserving method uh, still has some error, but it's a lot smaller. Um, and as I said, we also looked at the duct flow and we moved to very highly distorted meshes, which you can see here, uh, where if you look closely, some of the cells are almost completely flattened. Um, and in this case, the knee method uh, would blow up quite, uh, quite quickly, but the symmetry preserving method was uh, able to maintain uh, a stable solution. So that was also nice. So now let's talk about the HPC squared uh, framework. Since the 90s, the, there have been a developing trend in HPC computing, and um, a lot of changes have, have uh, taken place, and it's not really clear where it will be in the future. Um, so what we attempt to do at the lab, we've, we've, been, we've been updating our, our code to adapt to this, but now we aim to have a highly portable code for HPC. Uh, so that we can adapt to whatever the future may bring. And to do this, we move from a stencil-based code to an algebra-based code, 
which then relies on only a few very simple algebraic kernels, which can be easily ported to different architectures. Uh, and then the implemented kernels can be used on any architecture after that. Uh, so for the user, it's very simple. They do not have to port any code or rewrite any uh, or recompile any code. Uh, so let's talk about these algebraic kernels. First, we look at the continuous Navier-Stokes equations, where uh, the different continuous operators are denoted with different colors. Uh, subsequently, we move to an algebraic version of this with uh, matrices and vectors, uh, where you can see the corresponding uh, discrete operators. And now basically all of the operations fit in only three different uh, operations. Uh, the sparse matrix vector product, SPMV, the AXP, which is a linear um, combination of two vectors, and the dot product. So we only need to implement those three um, kernels in the end, uh, highly simplifying uh, our problem. Um, but now it becomes important also to talk a little bit about memory boundness. Uh, since uh, these kernels and a lot of calculations that we do in CFD, they're actually not at the peak performance of most supercomputers, but they're memory bound. So they're on the right, uh, on the left side of this diagram, which is the red part, um, because they have a very low arithmetic intensity. Um, so here you can see the dot and the AXP, they have a low arithmetic intensity and the SPMV is slightly higher. But because we are memory bound, it becomes important to talk about the hierarchy of our system and how uh, the system is uh, connected. So to gain speed up there. Uh, so how, how it's designed is uh, first, we have uh, the first level split at multiple nodes and they're in interconnected through a high bandwidth network and we use MPI at this level. Then for the different uh, cores inside this node, we use open API to make the second split. And then uh, depending on the design of the, of the node, we can uh, subsequently split um, to these multiple accelerators per node using open CL or CUDA at this level. So we have three different levels of the hierarchy. So if we have a large domain, um, which is depicted here on the right, we can split it on the first level with MPI then we'll split it into the host and coprocessors. And finally, we use multiple NUMI nodes in the many core CPU to make the third split. Uh, and this, this method was tested on uh, many different uh, architectures to see uh, how well it performed and how, the, the, how well it performed for different uh, scalings, uh, of which I don't show the results here, but uh, proved to be a, a good hierarchy, good architecture. So now let's move to the final part of the presentation, uh, where we exploit symmetries in the domain to speed up our processes even further. So here we have a domain with one symmetry and a domain with two symmetries. And what we first have to do to, uh, to achieve this speed up is to have a symmetry aware ordering of the, the cells. So for instance, we have a red and a blue cell and in the other side of the domain, they have to be numbered exactly in the same way uh, for this benefit to, to arise. And with two symmetries that would look like this. So once we use the symmetry aware ordering, we can reorder uh, our Laplace operator. The Laplace operator is, um, has inner connections so inside the uh, parts of the domain and between the those two symmetries, there are the connections, only a few connections denoted by L out. So it's almost already almost completely contained into the block diagonals of this uh, operator. Then we can use this S uh, transformation, which is just a combination of uh, block diagonal uh, identity matrices to transform this Laplace operator into a fully block diagonal operator denoted at the bottom by L in plus L out. So if we then have this example of a Laplace operator, we can use symmetries to reduce them to uh, two blocks, or if we have two symmetries to four blocks, or with three symmetries, we can move to eight uh, identical blocks. And then finally, what we can do is rewrite the sparse matrix vector product 
denoted by uh, identical blocks of the Laplace operator and one long column vector. We can split it to, into one of those blocks and um, a combination of the split column vectors. And these, this combination itself forms a, a matrix. So we move from an SPMV to a sparse matrix ma a matrix matrix product, which causes a reduction in time complexity uh, and in memory footprint, and it increases the arithmetic intensity, what we talked about before. So if we move back to this diagram uh, with the dot product and the SPMV, now we can see that the SPMM on this diagram is slightly more to the right. So we uh, increased the uh, performance simply by moving to a different uh, type of kernel. So that's also my final slide. Um, so in summary, the three parts of our work comp uh, compromise of symmetry preserving methods in uh, MHD. We use the HPC squared framework. And finally, we exploit symmetries in the geometry to even further speed up uh, our computations. So that was my presentation. Thank you for attending, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Interesting, interesting talk. Do you have any question from audience first? Question or comments? If not. I want to ask a question in slide number nine. Uh -huh. uh, probably I missed I missed uh, some some points of this. Probably I missed some points. Yeah, why did I think I guess these small lines they are the mesh, right? Yeah, yeah. The the lines you can see is the mesh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, it looks unconstructed mesh. Is it uh, dependent of the physics solution or simply given from the beginning and it doesn't change during the simulation? The mesh is given at the beginning and, and it doesn't change. Okay, so is there any reason the mesh uh, structures are different in two cases? Ah, uh, yeah, because there are two different cases, actually. So this is the, the Taylor Green Vortex, which I'm showing now, um, where you can see the highly distorted cells in the center. But then for the duct flow, because at the walls you want to be, uh, you want to have a higher resolution, we yeah. use this similar formula or similar uh, equation to do the distortion. So the distortion at the center is they, they look quite similar. But because the cells themselves, they are growing, it looks slightly different uh, because there's a okay. stretch. If you see the duct, it looks to me the mesh follows the structure or structure follows the mesh. I don't, I don't know. It yeah. looks to me like this. Is there any reason or I hope physics is not affected by... Yeah, uh, so... What what we do see is that uh, on this highly distorted grid, the, um, we lose some accuracy in our solution um, because of the extreme distortion that takes place. But our main point that we wanted to convey here is that the code is unconditionally stable. So even at this high distortion, it will produce a stable result. However, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to stay exactly uh, true to physics on, on this type of mesh, which in practice you wouldn't uh, often use, but mm -hmm. uh, the point of the symmetry preserving is that you um, do not introduce any uh, additional kinetic energy, so your system is stable. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, do we one last question? If not, yeah, small comments. Later part, your uh, symmetry, symmetry sparse uh, matrix. This one qu quite interesting. It may uh -huh. reduce the computing cost for future. Uh -huh. Do you have any expect expectation, for example, uh, how much extent computational cost can be reduced? For example, if you double the matrix, uh -huh. linearly 
it can be reduced uh, in some time. Um, I don't have the numbers uh, um, right now because this is mainly a part of, of a colleague of mine. Uh, but the important thing to note is that uh, the biggest um, advantage will be uh, will be uh, found in the Poisson equation because that's where you do the the uh, plus operator, and this already compromises a large part of your calculations. Mm -hmm. um, so for hydrodynamic cases, there was already significant uh, speed up, especially for three symmetries. Uh, okay. And on top of that, if you apply it in MHD, where in the electric potential formulation, you have a second Poisson equation, especially mm -hmm. in this case, it can be a quite significant uh, increase uh, or decrease at the time. Okay. Uh, I would have to refer you to the work of my colleague for the exact numbers. Uh, sorry. Oh, thanks. Well, it's uh, yeah. quite interesting. Um, Thank yeah. you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It's time to close the session. Thank you very much, all speakers. Was uh, your presentations were interesting and very, uh, yeah, interesting, promising. Uh, now let's move to the closing session. Now, Mary Kate, would you take place, please? Sure. Thank you so much. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, we've now come to the closing session of the third Fusion HPC uh, workshop hosted virtually from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Thank you all again for your lively participation in this workshop. We've seen some very informative, high quality talks, and I was glad to see so many interesting questions in the discussions. Reviews and feedback for our early career presenters are still being compiled. We will know who the top three outstanding presentations and prizes belong to early next week. And we will announce the winners on the website, hpcfusion.bsc.es. I'm very impressed, honestly, with all the early career presentations. Um, it's my sincere hope that the feedback contained in the reviews for all the presenters will be a useful tool in your continuing professional development independently from the prizes. The prizes again are this popular fiction novel origin, which takes place partially in Barcelona and features the BSC in the story and a USB laser pointer that you can use to control a slideshow. A third implicit prize is potentially the line you could add on your CV. And uh, as a reminder for all early career speakers, don't forget to add your presentation at this workshop to your CV. The recording will soon be available on the workshop website and the BSC YouTube channel with the link emailed to participants. Copies of most of the PowerPoints will also become available on the workshop website. Regarding the paper submissions to the special issue in the Plasma Physics and Controlled Fusion Journal, the program committee will contact the speakers who indicated interest or possible interest in submitting something. The deadline for submissions is expected to be in March of 2023. Next, please help us improve this workshop by taking part in a two minute post event survey the QR code is here. You might be able to use the camera app on your phone. Um, the link is also in the chat. Uh, the survey results after last year's workshop were one of the most important guides when planning this year's workshop. Um, for example, last year we used a webinar format, which was perfect for creating a sleek professional experience, but it also limited the interactivity among participants. Uh, but thanks to the post-event survey last year, we learned that some of these interactions were important for many participants, so we were able to plan around that. So now you can let us know what you thought about this year's workshop so that next year's program committee can take it into consideration. We are also happy to announce the new members of the program committee for the fourth Fusion HPC workshop. You can see them here. 
and we know that they will plan another excellent event. You can see a combination of existing program committee members and some new faces. With this, it has come time to say goodbye. We hope that you had an enjoyable and productive workshop. We thank all of our collaborators for supporting this workshop and all the speakers for sharing their work and progress. Finally, I want to thank all of you on behalf of the program committee and local organizers for participating in this workshop with your attention, your comments, and your questions. We hope to see you next time. That's it.